Hey everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and today I'm in Evansville, Indiana with Dan Siskin from Brickmania, and we are going to take a look at the USS Missouri battleship here. Now, longtime viewers of Beyond the Brick will remember that we covered this way back when Dan was first starting work on this. This is a 25 and a half foot model of the USS Missouri. It's, it's built in 135th scale, uh, a common scale I, I build in. I do a lot of military modeling. It's three months into the project. And then I've given some updates over the years, so we wanted to give kind of a final update here because I think it's about as finished as it's ever going to get, right, Dan? Right, right. It's, it's, it's probably had higher states of being finished, but every time we travel, some parts fall off and it needs a little bit of repairs, and this is sort of the state that it's, it's probably going to be in for the rest of the duration, unless we can get it permanently installed somewhere and I don't have to keep repairing it. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, then, if you want to take us through the ship here and kind of how it's set up right now. Sure. Well, right now, I mean, you on this side of it, everybody, you'll notice everybody's in their dress white uniforms. So it's it's set up exactly how the ship was in uh, September 2nd, uh, 1945, when the Japanese uh, government representatives came aboard and signed the basically the instrument of surrender uh, in Tokyo Bay, um, at, you know, ending World War II. So that, this is the way the ship was, and they all had, if you look at pictures, they were all the, all the sailors were wearing, they, they called them undress white uniforms. Um, and then they had all the brass, so you have all, the, all these officers down here. Um, they are like basically representatives of all the allied powers. You, know, you have all the, the admirals and generals involved. So MacArthur was there, Nimitz, Halsey, um, basically everybody who had a hand in the defeat of the Japanese empire uh, was aboard the ship that day. Mm-hmm. So. Fantastic. So that's a ton of minifigs then. So what, what else do we have in the ship here? Sure. Well, you, you will see this actually turned around. If this, typically this is set up on the other side. You'll see the guys in the dress blues, or the, 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 the blue dungarees. This is like an actual work uniform with their like life jackets on. This is how the other side of the ship would be you know, on display. So the other side, you'll see how it was when they were in a combat situation. So we have all these guys. Brick Arms actually made us some special shells for... Um, you know, that we can put in our anti-aircraft guns, uh, which actually are now just coming out to be available to the public. So it's kind of neat that some of the things that we have on the ship are actually prototypes or things that are products that have, that have turned into reality because of it. So. And you've got some lighting in here as well. Where all does that run through? Right, right. We did, uh, thanks, to, thanks to Rob from Brick Stuff, he, he set us up with a bunch of lights to, to really make the ship pop. We've had a couple of short circuit issues. So you see some of the wires outside. Usually that's tucked in inside of everything. I will actually, next time this is in our shop, I will rewire the whole, the, the whole ship just uh, because it, you know, <laughs> it looks a little schleppy with all the wires showing. But um, typically that's not the way it is. But it's uh, all the running lights. You have the searchlights lit up, um, running lights. I want to do more. Uh, but like I said, it's just always a matter of... Uh, uh, having enough time to do it when, when it's the few times it is in the shop because this is a big undertaking just setting this up to work on it in our shop it takes about 45 minutes um <laughs> you know unpacking it from its boxes setting it up i mean we could travel around with it and get it set up with a crew of people but um it, it's it's a lot of work <laughs> yeah. i imagine it's a very large build now one piece that you see a ton of on here are tiles and i think with uh, in this current iteration you've tiled like the entire deck now yeah there's not a spot on here and there's a few places here and there where you'll see stud showing and that's because it's not finished so like the backs of the turrets you'll still see the stud showings but that's not really you know people don't really notice mm -hmm. it because it's, it just blends in so well but. So was it difficult to source that many gray tiles for a build of this size? I mean, I know Brickmania is a big company. You've got a lot of builds you're doing, but still, that's a lot of pieces. Yeah, there's a, probably 150,000 tiles on the ship, or maybe more, maybe like 200,000 tiles, just tiles. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of going to, to pick a brick. It's a lot of uh, 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 brick link orders, and and uh, yeah, it's it's just it, it hasn't. It's not something that just happened overnight. There was <laughs> there was like a year and a half of planning that went into this before I even started putting the bricks together. So, and believe it or not, we're actually getting ready to do our next big mega build too. So, wow. <laughs> so you heard it here first. <laughs> there you go. Brick Mini will have another massive ship touring around. <laughs> it will be. It'll be as exact, just as big as this one. So. Okay. We'll look forward to that. So then you've got, down here is an example of one of the, the kind of bigger turrets on yeah. the ship. So talk about kind of the design of this and how that fits in. Well, the, the, obviously the turrets on one of these ships are just massive. This is like the size of a house. Um, and it's built, I, I'll pull the top off. You can see how it's built inside. Um, I never, I had, I had high, high hopes that I would actually one day be able to motorize all these guns, and um, I probably still can if I, if I come up with the time, but you can see that it's hollow in there, and these guns would actually be able to depress into the turrets just like a real ship. Um, someday I'll get around to doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is built to travel, so we you take these turrets off, and it just comes off, there's gravity holding it on, just like the real ship. Um, let's see if I can get it back on in one piece. 
That's always a trick. <laughs> yeah. It takes a special skill to get the yeah, turret yeah, back on. <laughs> but then the guns just pop right off, so this, it's, it's designed to travel. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, you obviously had travel in mind when you were designing this. Yeah, well, the, every section, I learned the hard way that you cannot build anything wider than a door. So I've actually had, to, I had these giant castles that I used to build, and, and one day I moved, and I was like, oh, how do I get it out of the house? So now, um, having learned that's not a good idea to build wider than 30 inches, it's built in sections since 30 inch slices and go through any size standard size door. Okay. Yeah. That so makes a lot of sense then. So do you have any idea how many different shows this has been to over the last several years as you've toured around? You know, it's, it's really hard to judge. <laughs> it's, it's at least a hundred different, different wow. locations. Yeah. Um, there was a year, I mean, this year, this has only traveled to like maybe five events this year. Uh, in previous years, it's been like 30, you know, the year before 30. So maybe not, maybe not a hundred, maybe like, but still definitely over 50, mm -hmm. um, for sure. Yeah. So has it traveled outside the U.S. or is taking it kind of overseas or anything ever a possibility in your mind for something this size? It, it, it could go anywhere. It's just a matter of cost, you know. Um, it's it's been it's been for the four corners of the U.S. I mean, it's for sure it's been to California, it's been to uh, Florida, New England, Seattle, you know, every, and everywhere in between, you know, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, well, that's massively impressive. So then what is the exact, you've mentioned a couple of times how, you know, setup is a really big deal with this. So when you bring this to show, what exactly is that like? What's kind of the process like for that? Well, we have to, t I'll just show you how the sections come apart here. So this is, this. you're looking at one section. It just slides apart. Um, and we can pull the, pull the different sections apart. So you can see 30 inches. Um, it's actually built to, to withstand just you being able to pick it up and okay. kind of manhandle it well, except the, the figures. <laughs> but it's it's definitely built for strength. Um, you, you could stand on this without any 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 problem whatsoever. Um, so you have all these sections. It's actually resting on its crates. So below this 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 custom drop that we had made for it, um, there's there's ten packing crates, and those crates become you know it's a stand when we're when we're parked, you know on display. But uh, when we're not on display, it packs up inside the base. Mm -hmm. so. And I'm sure a lot of that support for, comes from the inside structure there. So what's that like with the, the kind of you know columns and things that keep this up? It's a it's a technic. Here I'll, I'll actually pull this turret off again, and you'll be able to see that it's a, it's a it's technic beams um, throughout. Okay. So up top and bottom, you know it's a grid. Basically, it's like two pancakes. The deck is the top one pancake. The bottom is another pancake with bricks built up in between it. Uh, locked together with Technic beams, so it cannot. You can pick it up from the top, and the bottom will not drop out. Mm -hmm. And the whole ship is made that way. You can pick up the, the bigger pieces um, from the top, and the bottom will not fall off. Mm -hmm. So you've done a number of these large-scale builds like this. Then is that something you would recommend to other people if they're looking to build kind of on this scale? Is that type of structure works For really sure. well? I, I, this is my third big mega ship, kind of behind the Nicholas behind us here, being my second. That one has traveled a lot too, but it doesn't travel nearly as well. So a lot of lessons learned on previous builds to went into building this one. Mm -hmm. And then what are the plans for this? So I know we, we talked about how you've had this at a bunch of shows. Is it still planning to be touring in future years, or what's that going to be like? Well, we've kind of decided, you know, me being on the road and even Brick Mania's crew on the road, it, it's really hard on us. And it's mm -hmm. hard, hard on the models. It's hard on our, our, our staff because this is not our primary business. We, you know, we love to display our models, but ultimately we need to be back in our, in our, in our you know, in our toy factory <laughs> building toys for you know, our kits. So. We think what we want to do is, is park this thing permanently, uh, if not, you know, 100% permanent, at least have a, have a normal home where people can come and see it. Mm -hmm. um, that would be in our warehouse in Minneapolis. Where we used to have a big, our, our old warehouse, which we still use, is, our, is, is primarily where we construct all of our kits. Um, so now what we want to do is um, get another space because that's completely full. We, are, we have 30 workers back in Minneapolis and they completely fill our warehouse. So we're going to get another warehouse that we can put this in, be open to the public seven days a week. Mm -hmm. so. That would be fantastic. So people could come by and check it out in all its glory here. And then the next ship. So the, the space that we're looking at has room has room for two of these easily, okay. easily. Um, so it'd be open seven days a week. And you know, people always come by Minneapolis, and they they're kind of like, I, I you know, I want to see your your warehouse, but you're not open to the public. And all we can send them to is our store at the Mall of America, which is tiny and doesn't have much on display. And and you know, when we have these huge, beautiful models, we'd, we'd like to get the public to see them. Mm -hmm. So, Has there been any talk about taking this to the actual Battleship Missouri for a display ever? <laughs> well, we've been approached by some of the other ships in the class okay. about bringing it to their events. Uh, I think Hawaii might just be a little far, because that's where the real Missouri is. Um, you know, if, if obviously, if somebody's willing to pay for it, we would bring it wherever. Uh, and we, we have brought it to different shows on request. You know, we've, we've done video game conventions. We've done things like that. But... 
Um, typically speaking, uh, uh, non, you know, most of those things are museums or nonprofits, and they don't have a whole lot of money to, to, to throw around for right, displays. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, it's me. You know, we basically, Brickmania is a small company. I don't have a, a lot of money to say, hey, I want to show up and, and put this on display. Mm -hmm. so. No, that makes sense. Well, I'm glad you were able to bring it out here with a bunch of your other builds. Very nice display area here, and it's nice to get it out in public at least once more before it kind of parks itself a bit in the warehouse. Yeah, well, and, and when I say warehouse, it's kind of a misnomer because yeah. it'll be more of a museum right. setting like this. That we, we really appreciate being invited into a, a museum that has lights and um, you know nice facilities, whereas you know sometimes at Lego conventions, it's, 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 it's not necessarily in the best uh, viewing, viewing location. Yes, exactly. Well, I'm glad you could bring it out. Thanks again for setting the whole thing up here and getting the lights on and everything yeah. and taking us through the ship. Appreciate it, Ian. Yeah, there you go. That's how you build. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Legos.
I'm Jim Butte. I'm a hard luck nerd. Uh, this is my take on uh, USS Wisconsin. It's an Iowa class battleship. Um, we build uh, ships for the, the shipbuilding show in Norfolk every year, and it's an excuse to build things big and ridiculous. Uh, this is ours, and again, the show is at the, at the museum where the USS Wisconsin is, and so we, uh, we built, built it for that show. Uh, it's uh, old school Wisconsin. It's the World War II version, so it's just covered in anti-aircraft gun mounts. Uh, they've modernized them over the, the 50 years they were in service, so there's missiles and helicopter uh, launch pads and stuff like that on them now. Um, but uh, so it's almost entirely snot built, uh, built sideways, uh, and that gives you kind of a satisfying look for the deck of it where they've got that planked teak deck so you can put the, the plates together and it looks good. And then the, the gray bulkheads next to it, you can use the interesting elements to make bulkheads, doors, and, and things like that. Um, there's plenty of room under the, under the hood there, so we motorize the turrets. All those little five inch mounts are on a central gear that oscillates back and forth, and that, that's interesting for the kids. They come up and they want to see things. Uh, the big guns will, will train and elevate, uh, just using regular power functions and IR stuff, and, and uh, those are kind of interesting. Uh, fun to build. It's, it, it's neat to, to motorize things like this when you, when you put a big ship together that has room for it. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, the hull shape uh, worked on uh, expanding on the, the snot technique. There's this uh, technique where you, you take a small tile and then you put a small plate behind it and you take advantage of that small, you know, that tolerance, that gap that allows you to put the plates together and get them back off. You can get a little, little bitty angular displacement in each and you make a big, long, gradual curve. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty smooth hull for this, for this scale, which is about 100 to 1. Uh, that was based on uh, the, the gun barrels. We said, okay, that's got to look right. So the gun barrel is whatever it is, and everything else scales up and down from that. Sorry, I'm running at the mouth here. Um, uh, so that, that works out pretty well at that scale. Um, any questions? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> the, these no, no, great job. Good job taking us through it. These ships are, you know, all inspiring in real life, and I think you've captured so much of what, what makes these incredible. I love the motorized features. Talk a little bit more about kind of some of the detailing uh, on top of the deck here. You've got so many different areas that you've captured here. Yeah. Um, okay. So again, everything is haze gray on these ships, except for these. The, the only spot of color is there's flag bags, and those are where the signal flags are on the ship. So I was just delighted to put something that wasn't gray on this ship. So there's a flag. Bag back back aft and forward lots of antennas uh, smokestacks uh, all these little quad 40 millimeter gun mounts um, it was fun to design the first one but then you had to make 20 more of them and that got a little tedious and then these little 20 millimeter gun mounts the little little bitty things so there's just short of a zillion of those rotten things on there so yeah just mass production put them out and and, and make them um, what else we got? So you mentioned you mentioned earlier that the deck that you built kind of studs not on top that snot type building. So talk a little bit more about that technique for people who maybe aren't familiar with, with how that works and kind of how, how you can get that looking so nice. Sure. I've actually got a prop over here that I do for the for the folks who come to the show. Um, and, and again, instead of having a, you know a wall with a with a tile on top, you just turn it sideways. And for this scale, it's very satisfying. You get a gray bulkhead. And then the studs are again hidden by that that tile for the bulkhead, and then you get the the, the planking for the deck over top. Um, and again, gives you a, a more of a satisfying look than if you it had to stick it up there. Uh, building on it, I got another prop here. This is how we, we make the hull so smooth. If you get the plate behind the tiles, and then you can bend that and and make that work just like that. So how long is this whole build? Uh, it's about nine feet long, uh, which is a, it's a piece of work. Uh, comes comes apart in three sections. Uh, the middle section, everything's straight and parallel and perpendicular, so that that comes out as one piece. And again, like a horse, they're tricky on both ends. So the front end is all curvy and obnoxious, so that's one its own piece. And the back end is all curvy and obnoxious, so that's another piece. And so three big pieces for the hull. And then the decks kind of come apart like a layer cake. Again, with a snot building, they just slide in and they, they attach with the studs to a, a big a sideways piece that's under, under the hood there. One of, one of the, the most impressive parts of these battleships is always these big the big turrets on these. So talk a little bit more about the design of those. You've got some angles in there, so I'm sure that's not always easy to capture. If, if you're interested, and I'll, I'll pull one off here a second here. Uh, I'll regret this. Uh, so there's uh, using the angle plates, uh, the ball joints, make it easy to to achieve the right shape by by uh, using a ball joint behind it and then you can just 
put put these things where they're at because again they're a very weird faceted shape for those things um, for training and elevating I, I wasn't smart enough to do it elegantly so I just brute forced it there's a bunch of reduction gears in here the motor for elevation actually comes up through the deck and and plugs into the turret and that that controls elevation and then under the deck there's the the motor that controls this little little turny thing here that uh, that gives us the the training of the turret so uh, it's one way to skin the cat. I'm sure your viewers have got lots of other ways to do it, and that's the, that's the M and mock. You know, it's my way of doing it. I'm sure there's, there's other better ways, but this is mine. For sure, yeah, and it looks like he was running very smoothly. So uh, do all the moving parts work pretty normally for long periods of time? Or uh, Good question. They, <laughs> they do now. Last night I learned that just because it would work a few times didn't mean that it would stand up to what a show does. So my friend Dan and I were in here last night learning, uh, learning new ways to pin things in so they didn't work themselves loose. So it's pretty sturdy now, but it wasn't last night. One Sorry. thing that some people might be surprised to see is some airplanes here on this, because it's a battleship. It's not an aircraft carrier. So kind of what's the story behind those on a, on a battleship? I guess, uh, well, historically, the seaplanes, they were, again, they can go up high, uh, and they, they had a couple different kinds, but they would launch them off these catapults, and they're up, up way up high, and they're, they're the eyes of the fleet. You know, you can see miles and miles and miles out there. Um, and they would land in the water, and then this big honking crane back here would help them get them back on the deck and, and things like that. Um, on the ships themselves over the years they modernized and of course the helicopter came around and they realized hey if I could if I can land a helicopter vertically I don't need these seaplanes anymore and these catapults and these cranes so the modernized actual ships uh, if you ever get to go see one do because it's it's really neat uh, they've got a helicopter flight deck back there instead of those catapults for the old seaplanes and so I think you mentioned this this ship still exists today, right? Yep. Uh, this one's uh, this is Wisconsin. She's down in Norfolk. That's where we're at. So we get to go see it whenever we want. I think all four of these are floating museums someplace throughout the country. So yeah, go see them if you can. So as you were working on this model, were you using uh, kind of photos or blueprints of the real ship? What, how, how did you kind of capture it at this scale? Uh, there, there's an old Ravel model that's about nine inches long that I had when I was a kid, and that was just perfect because yeah, I could you know I could say okay if it's if it's if the gun barrel is this big on the model and it's got to be this big in real life, I just multiply by whatever that factor was. So I just use that to kind of scale up the actual proportions to get the shape from that model, and then actually yeah we took a we took a little trip out to the actual Wisconsin and to look around and take some pictures of the deck stuff to get those details that make it look right and real. Now we're going to look inside the ship for a little bit to show you more of those details that you can't see from the outside. So go ahead and what do you have for us? All right, uh, to field strip this thing, first thing you do, you, you got to take off the big turrets. Uh, and those are, are awkward. Uh, the, the motors that drive the elevation actually have to come up through the deck. So each, each of the turrets I have to pull off individually at, at the start. And that lets us do some other stuff. And it takes a little while because the motors are plugged in to that drivetrain. It looks like you handle it pretty expertly, though. Well, no, I'm breaking things as I go, so <laughs> I'll pay for this in a few minutes when i got to put it back together. But it's, it's actually not too bad. It's, it's given me enough grief. I've had to take it apart and put it together a few times. Um, the top, um, the superstructures, you know, the tops of the, the stacks and the masts are all kind of modular, so they all can just kind of pop off. And you've got various different little components uh, that, that you take and you can <laughs> store them and, and transport them separately. Well, this is a good lesson for anyone building like this. That modular style is so important when you're bringing this to a show and transporting it. Yep, that's a fact, uh, especially if you drive a small car like I do because this rotten thing won't fit anywhere. But there's certain, again, after a while you get used to it. And now, unfortunately, all these little five inch turrets, they plug down in axles that I need to pull those out because the axles just fit right into the uh, the oscillation distribution system down below. There's one one gear, one gear that's driving all the the five inch gun mounts and my friend helped me figure out how to make that oscillate back and forth and there's just one big long axle that we tap off from and that gives us motion for all the five inch mounts. Do -do -do. Pull those out. And like you were saying earlier, they put a lot of guns on these things. <laughs> it's, it's all about it. They had all that real estate, and, and back in the day, that's how you killed an airplane, is you threw a bunch of bullets in the sky, and, and they had as many gun barrels as they could doing that as fast as they could. So, um, it's, it's, I'm a little bit embarrassed now. As I take this apart for, for your education, you're going to see all the junior varsity sketchy stuff under the hood that, that I hide beneath the veneer. Um, so... There's various components that, again, just slide in. Then the top layers, got a couple more to go here. 
This is great to see how this all comes together. Though. Yeah, and it's all one big rainbow build inside here. Uh, every everybody, you know, I couldn't use any gray inside because I knew I was going to use every single gray piece I have on the outside. So the the decks are built up just like a layer cake. So you get one big hunk of deck there that can come off and goes like that on both sides. And taking it apart is quicker and easier than putting it together. You really get a good idea of how parts intensive that deck building is with all of those plates yep. in there. Yep, and you'll see, yeah, some of the, the cheesy little things where it was too hard to actually, a lot of these little deck fixtures are actually built into the deck. Some of them I just, I cheated and I set them on the deck after the fact because I had enough of them. All right, and now we'll pull off this other piece of the main deck. I'm sorry, the, the O1 level, not the main deck. So in the Navy, they number the decks up from, from the main deck and the O1 level, the O2 level, etc. The higher you go, the bigger number you get. Okay, so that's the, the deck deck. Um, down here, you can see there's a single, if I turn it on, there's a single oscillating gear that's driving this one axle back and forth. And we've just tapped off to that, so each side, so there's 10 of those 5-inch gun mounts, and that just lets them move back and forth, and the, the kids like to see the motion, and they say, ooh, gee, that's neat. So that's one way to do that pretty easy. The foc'sle is tricky. Um, so I had a, when you're snot building, you got to pin it into your build someplace. So we pin it in here back near midships. And as you put the foc'sle on or take it off, you've got to put those motors through. So those motors that control the elevation are actually up in the gun, gun turrets. And the whole foc'sle comes off by itself. And you can see how much it flexes. The, that's that uh, hinge building in snot because the foc'sle of these ships, it, it goes up gradually, but so gradually there's not really a good way to do it with a single Lego piece. So you've got to, got to cheat and get a very gradual vertical curve out of the deal. I'm feeling nervous looking at all, looking at how much that's flexing as you're carrying that around. But it look, <laughs> I, I, I know how to handle it now. But yeah, back in the day, there were lots of, lots of exciting moments uh, taking that apart and putting it together. Um, inside, again, rainbow build. There's lots of structure behind those, those curves to kind of discipline that and keep the hull where we want the hull to be to make it look right. Uh, here's the central, the, the drivetrain that, 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 that turns the, the, uh, the front two turrets. And my friend Dan and I were in here late last night reinforcing this because these things were working themselves out. It worked great a couple times, but yeah, you learn. You got you to gotta pin everything in. So, uh, so there's the, the drivetrain that, that moves those, trains the, the turrets side to side. And then again, the, the elevator, elevating motors go up and sit in the turrets. Uh, I, I'm pinned in here pretty hard, but you can see the joint. Here's the front section. Um, I, 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 it'll take me 10 minutes to take this apart, so I won't waste your time with that. <laughs> front section slides off. Back section, same thing. Um, there's a lot of things here that just come right off. They pop off the back. Seaplanes are not fixed on there. These catapults can just pop off. And the back, the, uh, the fantail here, we, we kind of pin that in here, and this is the... I don't know, it's, you can call it tricky or not, but hiding seams is, is the big job in the build. So there's a seam where this thing comes in, and we've done a pretty good job of just hiding that seam. And then back aft, you can see, again, a lot of discipline to keep those curves where you want them, and another drive motor for that, that rear turret. And that's probably more than you wanted to know about the inside of that. You can edit that down to about 30 seconds of useful footage. Oh, no, that's fascinating to see, to see how that all comes apart, and also the contrast. Oh, you've got your helpful assistant over here. <laughs> Dan's the brains of the outfit. No, no, thank you very much. Yeah, being in a lug, you got lots of guys that are going to teach you how to do new things, and they're going to help you fix it when it breaks in the middle of the night. So we're good. I love the contrast of the interior with the pink and all that color and then all the gray on the outside. Yeah, again, complete rainbow build. Every time we're building something big, we figure out, okay, what color's got to go on the outside, and I use every other color on the inside just to use it up and, and do that structure stuff. So. so for me, what's always interesting with a model like this that's very large, you have movement in here, is kind of the planning process. So what, did you kind of sketch this out or use anything like that, or was this all just kind of throwing bricks together as you went along? Uh, a lot of a lot of trial and error and a lot of I've got a notion and let's work on that notion and, and we'll iterate and okay I knew there was going to be like a you know a central distribution for oscillation so I figured it out and another friend in the lug helped me out with that um, but yeah more winging it than actual planning sorry but you, you, you wing it and you reiterate and you wing it some more and pretty soon it, it converges on a, on a battleship. 
Yeah. So. And I love that you can see it laid out on all these tables here. You just how much detail you have on top of that, and how much you pack in on top of the deck. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, it's a big ship, and as you said before, it's an awesome ship in real life, and uh, trying to do it justice at this scale, you need a lot of bricks. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to dig even deeper into the build with us here. I really appreciate it. No, thanks for tolerating that. I'm joined by Dan Siskin from Brickmania, and he's going to take us through this massive D-Day layout here uh, for you know some longer-term viewers of Beyond the Brick. You might recognize something we covered a couple of years ago that had a, a similar layout, but uh, Dan switched up the ships and things here, and there's some some new details and everything. So if you want to take us through the whole layout then? Sure, yeah. The last, the previous version of this, I think it had the LST in it. Mm -hmm. So the LST was actually donated LST to LST 325. We we actually built, turned, converted it into their ship. So we wanted to preserve the D-Day diorama. And this is actually what we wanted to do from the get-go, depicting it as it was on June 6, 1944. So this is like the initial waves of the Americans and allies hitting Omaha Beach. So we shortened the amount of water because we don't have that gigantic ship in the way anymore. And we it extended the beach. The diorama is exactly the same size. There's just a lot more of it now. Okay. So a lot more land. So what you see out in the water here, these are landing craft. The big ones are landing LCTs. They're landing, uh, the one the camera's on now, that's LCM, landing craft mechanical. Basically, one Sherman tank would fit in there. Uh, they didn't like to do that because it's so heavy that it almost waterlogs the boat. Uh, we did get a, a nice donation of brick arm shells. So <laughs> as you see, it is completely full of shells. There's definitely no smoking allowed on that boat, but they're firing their guns anyway. Um, the bigger craft, the, these are LCTs. They're landing. They're, it's a it's a landing craft that can hold up to five Sherman tanks. Uh, for the sake of this diorama, we only have two on each. On each, um, I think we've pilfered tanks off of these for other other dioramas. <laughs> <laughs> so in the water, you have we have two of these. One that that old one in the back that they're, the cameras on right now. That's old gray. So that's that thing's been around for a, quite a long time. One of my older models. And then Cody built a newer version of it in front here. Um, his is new gray. Uh, he probably had a better better use of parts than I did. Anyway. <laughs> you just struggle with what was available back then. Yeah, that was built years and years ago before before Brickmania was really as big as it was, and I, and I, my budget was a lot smaller. So that's a that's an old castle taken apart right there, <laughs> for sure. So we have all the lit the lit up landing craft uh, in the water. The the machine guns are actually it's a lighting effect from brick stuff. These are I believe older older. Uh, machine gun effects boards they, they kind of flash an awful lot so it looks like they those machine guns would be overheating <laughs> by now at this no, point. No but it adds a great kind of popping effect so do you is that right. kind of difficult to add into these or talk about kind of logistics of adding lights in like that to so many of these kind of builds? The lights aren't aren't they're, they're really not difficult the brick stuff lights uh, the only drawback about them it's actually a kind of a blessing and a curse the wires are very thin and they're very delicate so you can easily break the wires oh, okay. on the other hand they're really easy to conceal mm -hmm. so like it's it's two sides of the same coin we're traveling a lot we tend to like stuff gets banged around if you're building at home you're probably a little more intense with the models than most builders would be right and and a lot of hands because you know when, when brick mania sets up a huge display like this it's not just me putting it together if i was to set this up by myself it would be like two eight hour days so two, i think we've, we figured out this particular diorama two people takes eight hours to set up four people can do it in four hours and it's 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 just a hugely you know time consuming process and when you have that many hands in it there's definitely like different people are going to do stuff differently and they may not know the whole system of how the lights are how fragile things are so uh we've learned by experience to bring extra spares with <laughs> lights and stuff like that but if you're doing it at home and you know exactly the whole system you the lights are easy. Everything's easy to work. And that's with. why you do things like that. You know, the parts dumping with the water because obviously that saves time. Yeah, you, if you go back and look at your old videos, I'm sure you can see that the blue, the water's blue, and we we used to do a lot more with the wakes and and and, and like an hour and hour is like oh, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> we've given up. Mm -hmm. So um, we've we've spent many days, many hours sorting sorting water <laughs> back to its original base colors. So here we have one of the one of the landing craft took a took a direct hit from the Germans and. There's there's a an awful lot of blood in the water here, but that's kind of the way it was. And mm -hmm. so we we usually limit ourselves to sort of PG displays, but this time we were like, okay, well, well, this is this is probably the last time this diorama. Actually, I can tell you right now, this is the last time this will be viewed by the public. So we are building an aircraft carrier, and this will all become part of the aircraft carrier. <laughs> so everything that's gray you see here will be part of the aircraft carrier. Even the tan, even the beach will be mm -hmm. inside somewhere. So. And then we've got this crazy box looking thing going here. So talk about what that is for so, people who might not be familiar with that. Actually, to start with that, you can look at the one on the ground here. So it's the same thing. So this is a Sherman tank and that 
dark tan thing that that ring around it. It's what they call a. It's it's like a waiting. It's like basically a a, a canvas boat that wraps around the the tank. They drop the skirts down, raise up the sides. And then you end up with something that looks like this in the water. It's basically a flotation device for a Sherman tank. Mm -hmm. And just the air inside of that is enough buoyancy to keep that Sherman tank from sinking. And the guys were way down inside of it. They'd have to stand up on the roof. And you can see them bailing water out of it in there, too. But they'd have to stand up on the roof of the tank and yell down orders like, go left, go right. So they swam these tanks ashore. It's a duplex drive. The one on the shore here, you can see the little propellers. Let me, let me uh, turn it. You'll be able to see the little propellers. Duplex drive, because there's two, two, two propellers sticking out of the back of the thing. It crawled through the water like three miles an hour or something. So these were supposed to hit the beach first, the first wave of D-Day. And it took them so long to get to shore that the infantry actually beat them to shore. Oh, yeah. And some of them just sank outright. Like, you can see those guys bailing water yeah, on that, that one. It seemed like a fun job there. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, the Americans, because the Americans landed on Omaha Beach, um, on Omaha Beach, I think they lost about half of them to being swamped by the waves. Uh, the the British were luckier. They they landed on a more sheltered beach. They didn't they didn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. so. so then as we come ashore here, what do we have? You have the infantry. So the they the Americans landed during low tide. The Allies, not just the Americans, landed on low tide. As you can see, these the obstacles. These these are like basically like t t obstacles just just designed to destroy landing ships. So you have these wooden, you know, they're gigantic sharp wooden objects sitting in the water, covered with mines. So if a ship came and landed at high tide. It would basically hit these mines and blow up. And, you know, if you have a, a ship full of troops, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the Allies decided they would land at high tide or low tide, so the water's way out here. Unfortunately, it means that also there's this huge expanse of beach between the water and um, the, the, the waiting Germans on the other mm -hmm. side. So this is just basically a killing zone. So all the, all the Americans had to wade through the water all the way across the beach um, before they could even get to within range of, uh, you know, possibility of even fighting the, the, the Germans, let alone getting up off the beach. So um, you have a lot of guys running through the open expanse. Um, engineers came through and blew up all these, all these mines and stuff. But this is how it was before the beach was secured. Yeah, and you can just see, you know, there would have been a lot of this open space and everything, like you said, there's there's not a lot to protect yourself. Right, yeah, it took a lot of guts to run across, but if you stayed in one place, you'd be, you're just, you're actually more likely to get shot by not moving because you just present yourself as a target. So mm -hmm. so this is a lot of minifigures, <laughs> as you can see. These are all old Brickmania figures that, that we, you know, uh, pilfered from our own stash to, to, to make this, this beach scene, so... Mm -hmm. And then what are some of the obstacles we have as you get closer up here? Yeah, so these are designed to destroy, these, these out here, these are designed to destroy ships. As you get closer to shore, these black things are anti-tank obstacles. So they're called like tetra hit, the tetrahedrons uh, was one name. Um, they have a, the, they're basically tank traps. Um, so the infantry could get past them, obviously, but the, the tanks would get hung up on them. They, they wouldn't be able to get past them. So engineers had to either come and bulldoze them out of the way or blow them up. And... Uh, as you get closer to the shore, the the Germans said they had this whole, there's a, basically a sand berm, like a hill with barbed wire running across the top. If you wanted to get through it, you'd have, basically you'd get, you know, the idea was that you'd have to run up to the barbed wire, try to climb over it, and then you're an easy target for the for the guys waiting up on the hill. Mm -hmm. So um, these guys are trying to blow a hole through the the, the uh, barbed wire so they could get through. I mean, this is, this is what really happened on D-Day, so... Um, I don't know about the Captain America part. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard he was there. It depends on which history book you're reading. <laughs> right. So these guys are they're basically stuck at the sand berm. You know, the next phase would be them, you know, uh, they actually had to, like, get through the barbed wire, get up into the into the top of the, uh, um, the hills here and take out the Germans in any way they could. So at the point in this battle right now, the Americans haven't gotten through the front, but you have some guys up on top. You have some paratroopers up on top that did manage to make it up there. Again, I don't know about the the uh wonder woman part but i, I heard she was there <laughs> <laughs> and then you even got kind of trenches in the in the built yeah, into the cliff the, the whole the the cliff this is this is omaha beach and the cliffs above omaha beach were heavily fortified so the germans had built bunkers into the into the into the into the cliff face gigantic naval guns um some of the guns aren't some of the elect lights aren't exactly working right now and quite frankly, since we're tearing this apart next week, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I won't. There's only I won't. so much you're putting into it. Right, right. So it's traveled around quite a bit. Um, I'm looking for, you know, I, I look at this and I'm like, oh, I want all these bricks because mm -hmm. below the surface here is just, it's just, you know, two by four bricks. It's like, it's like builder's gold. 
That, that'll be the, the inside of whatever, you know, next big ship you're doing. It'll be an aircraft carrier. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll spill the beans right now. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so how, how long is this whole thing, do you know? Right, what you're looking at right now is 24 feet. Okay. We've made this thing as long as 30 feet in the past. Depends on where we go, what we have for table space and what we're putting on it. So this is, this is about average. Usually it's about 24 feet. Mm -hmm. Do you try to build pretty much most of your displays to kind of be flexible like that? Because obviously you're taking it to different size shows and everything, so it needs to be able to move around and then be able to set up at different sizes. Well, we typically would build to the uh, table size. So standard uh, standard banquet tables are 30 inches deep by 8 feet long. for and So we build to that. Um, our own tables that we buy are 30 by 60, and we try to make it so we can shift around. You know, that's perfect for Lego base plates. Okay. Uh, four Lego base plates equals 60 inches wide. And... Two, two Lego base plates deep is 30 inches wide. So uh, it's a standard banquet table that work really well with Lego. So, um, so that this one is one of the few ones that we can actually customize in length because the water is just any length that we want to make it. The shore is the shore is 12 feet. And we can't do anything about that because it just gently slopes all the way down. But we do, I mean, especially some of the other displays that don't have fixed boundaries, we can make them any size we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm sure that's nice as you guys go to so many shows over the years in all different areas setting up. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So we bring our own tables sometimes. If we don't have room, we rely on what, what the, the, the destination location has or if we're like at a, at a convention or something. Sometimes the tables are just weird sizes <laughs> and, and we do, we make, we make do. We've actually gone to TV studios to set up stuff and they, they're like, oh, we were supposed to bring it half tables for you. Like, so we've had to improvise. Uh, we've, done, we've done stuff on bar stools. We've done, you, know, you name it, we've done it. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, nice. Well, I'm glad we are able to capture this one last time before you tear this apart for the next big aircraft yeah. carrier built. Yeah, this, this, this is a fun one, but yeah, it's, it's time to go. We'll do another D-Day, some tie-in next year. Hey everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and today I'm at the Brickmania headquarters in Minneapolis, and I'm joined by Dan Siskind and his latest ship model here. So if you want to take us through what this build is. Sure, this is the USS O'Hare. This is a gearing class destroyer built during World War II uh, as part of the US Navy's effort. Of course, uh, these gearing class destroyers were designed to take part in, uh, in the Pacific campaign. Um, they're actually bigger than the previous destroyers. They, they added a, an extra 16 feet of length or 14 feet of length just to put extra fuel oil in them so they'd have more range for these big Pacific cruises. Um, this is the USS O'Hare. The reason we chose the O'Hare is because of our, our store location. We wanted something, something that would have a connection to the Chicago area. And what's better than the USS O'Hare? Of course, there's O'Hare Airport. It's not named after the airport, it's named after the same guy. It's uh, Edward Butch O'Hare. He was a uh, Medal of Honor recipient in World War II and uh, was instrumental in, in, in creating the tactics, the air tactics, air to air. He was, a, he was a military and Navy pilot and he was instrumental along with uh, Thatch, another uh, US Navy, famous US Navy pilot in World War II for, for inventing the tactics that basically how to defeat the Japanese Zero using the, the US Navy's Wildcats and Hellcat fighters. Um, he was shot down during World War II, and of course they named the ship after him, uh, as the Navy does. <laughs> and here we have built it. So this is built basically as it was at the end of World War II. Um, this ship actually served in the US Navy through the early 1970s. Uh, went through many reconfiguration changes as all these gearing dis class destroyers were. They are very modern for their time, very large destroyers. And uh, um, this, this model represents that in its kind of heyday when they first built it. So it had quite a long career then, even after the war. Oh yeah, like a 30 year career for sure. Um, it went on to, it participated in all sorts of like uh, Mediterranean cruises, um, you know, several, several like, you know, Cold War crises, uh, participated in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, a part of the blockade of Cuba. Um, so here, you know, we have it basically configured as it was, as it was built. Um, it wasn't painted this color. After the war ended, they painted all the U.S. Navy ships were painted a flat gray, uh, nice, nice uniform finish. They they were probably built in a different camouflage. I think this was a darker a darker ship when it was first built. So great. So it's a fantastic history there. And then let's dive into the model itself and how this kind of came together for you. Right. This this is a, this is not my first minifig class, <laughs> the minifig scale destroyer. Uh, it's it's unique in 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 some ways because. Uh, 
as you mentioned, this is my sh my creation at the beginning of this of the of the the video. Actually, technically, it's not. This is the first big build like this that I haven't you know kind of greedily held to okay. myself. Uh, when I first started making these ships, Brickmania was much smaller, so it was just me building. And now we have multiple builders, lots of talented people here, and we use some of that talent to make a design that more people could come in and put their hands on and use their expertise to, to get started. So as you may notice, um, the ship itself, it's, it's sitting on this, this gigantic vinyl thing that we printed here. It's, you can come through. Um, but we, we basically, we did this, we tried to figure out a way, like uh, the biggest obstacle for building a ship and getting this, this hull curve just right is actually just that. I, I'd have to eyeball it, do it by hand. So on the previous ships, that's how I've done it. On this one, we actually made a a diagram. We took a 3D model of the ship, made a diagram of how we could, you know, how how was the ship made, how was it built, and used this diagram to um, basically, in a sense, mirror or like show the the whole form. Um, let me grab one of the actual get some of the building material sheets. for it. Yeah, should have should have had this ready. But this this is an example of these are hull sections. These hull sections actually correspond with the stripes. These, these rainbow colors are different layers of plates. So we were actually able to build the ship. Um, each, each builder got a section like this to build, to, to make this hull pattern. And once that hull pattern was built, we built this internal frame to hold everything together. This ship, of course, is meant to move. It's not, it's not gonna be on display in, in Minneapolis here. So it's built to move. These are heavy, heavy duty sections of the ship, but it's built in such a way that you can grab in here and without any fear of the ship coming apart. I mean, you can grab the top if you want to. The bottom will not drop out. It's built to move. It's built into um, four evenly spaced sections. It's exactly how we moved the Nicholas, the USS Nicholas. In fact, we moved it recently to Chicago for an event in our, in our Woodfield store, and we brought it in the Nicholas, USS Nicholas's crates. It's designed specifically that we can make one shipping system that would pretty much take any ship that we built, uh, this being no exception. So you've definitely learned over the years and the, the models you've worked on kind of the best way to make it sort of structurally strong and be able to move it around easily. Yeah, I learned the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time uh, Lando and I drove out to, um, to Brick Fair, Virginia with the USS Nicholas, it didn't survive the trip. It, we, hit, we hit some uh, traffic in Chicago and, it, and again in Ohio and you know, a couple of abrupt stops caused uh, some major destruction of the ship. Of course, we did get it together on the other end in Virginia, put it together so it could be on display. But uh, we figured we needed a transportation system, we need a box, we need somehow a way to get it there, and we just need to build stronger. So every ship that's been built since then um, has been built sturdier. This one, I could stand on it without any, any hesitation. So, um, and that's kind of the test that we've been doing lately. The, the, the Missouri was the first ship that I was confident I could stand on top of it without a breaking. This one, without a doubt, this is even stronger than that one. So uh, all these sections, I mean, it's, you're, Hold it. <laughs> it's sturdy. It it's is, not, it's, yeah. It's no. not, not going to come apart. Like you can move that around without any problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and that's, that's what we're, the aim is. These, this is. This is actually going to be a permanent fixture of our new Schaumburg store, but until that time, it's got to get there, and uh, it may end up going on the road at some point. Right. If, if the right event happens, we need to do a gathering of all the Brickmania ships, we'll go grab it and, and we'll bring it there. So. And I saw this image on the other side here, so how does this kind of play into the design process as you're looking at that? So when you're, when you're we, we, we basically bought a 3D model of a gearing class destroyer, a scale model, and this is sort of a diagram of, of this is actually kind of an artist's conception of a conceptualization of what a gearing class destroyer is. A lot of it's correct, but a lot of it we've noticed is incorrect. So um, we had to actually, at one point, abandon the, the, the model that we bought. It was great for building the hull, but actually getting all the stuff on the deck. If you, as you pan down, you can notice that there are significant differences, what they show versus reality. Um, so there's a lot of studying pictures, a lot of looking at other, other diagrams that, to figure out exactly where everything was supposed to go. And even then, it was a little foggy. I, I, I did a lot of building and then realized later, oh, this needs to be rebuilt, this needs to be rebuilt. So. Um, that's kind of the nature of the beast when you're doing something for the first time and it's, you're trying to do a historical representation, you really have to study uh, all the sources that are available um, and then realize which ones are correctly, you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's annotated to the certain ship, it has to be actually that ship. So. Right, work through the inaccuracies and that sort of thing. Right, process of elimination. <laughs>
So what are some of your favorite details kind of on the deck and as we have on top here? Well, uh, this, this the way that this, this ship is. This, it uses these, uh, these are twin five inch gun turrets. Same turrets that are actually on the USS Missouri. So that was another thing. When we, we split up things on the ship um, that we could duplicate. So these, these five inch turrets, uh, somebody just grabbed one off the Missouri, copied it. The twin bofers here, basically copies of, of, of turrets that we'd made for previous things. The funnel is the same. Everything is, is kind of a copy of what we've done before, um, but we're able to mass produce them. So these, these, these uh, quad 40s, you know, the US Navy is very good at making things modular. When something breaks, they can just swap it out for another. Uh, and they famously have done that. They, um, they'll take parts of ships that are, that are leaving uh, a theater of operations and like, oh, we need that turret. And they'll take it off and stick it on another ship that, that ha maybe has one damaged. So um, it's the same way for us. We can, we can copy, the, copy the same thing same sort of details, modularity. Um, there's a lot that still needs to be done, lots of little things. So next time you see the ship, it, it should be a lot more detailed. I mean, if you look at it now, you could, you could easily say it's done, but. <laughs> there's always little small things I'm sure you can add on to it. Yeah, and, and, and sort of we've, we've gone to the next level. Um, with the previous ships that we've done, we've done every detail we could possibly find. And this ship being no exception, it's like, we, we have to have this up to the same expectations. If you see one of our models, in one of our stores, it's going to have to match the same sort of quality that any other model that, that Brickmania has. So you're, you're looking at about 95% complete. And those like extra 5% of details, they, they matter. It all matters. I yeah. Don't, I don't, I don't want adds. somebody to point out some inaccuracy because we forgot to do it or just didn't take the time. And I think it's those little details that really pull people in when they're looking at the model. Yeah. And of course, we have, we'll, we'll put some Easter eggs in here. <laughs> we, we, we built some, uh, we built some uh, uh, like, I guess, stages. So, so places that we can hide things, and uh, they, they will be, they will be, uh, you know, highlighted later. <laughs> we, we don't want to give it away now. Sure. So. so you've gotten the shipbuilding and kind of design process down to such a science, and you seem to have really uh, gotten it down well. So what's your plans for the future here? Where, what's your next kind of big projects? Well, we have a bunch of things on on deck. Um, so there's stuff that th this is for us. This is this is obviously going to be in one of our stores. We can bring it on display. Um, the U.S. Navy is as is. It, getting us to build a ship for them. So we're building a ship for the um, History and Heritage Command um, this summer. It'll be another destroyer. It won't be, it won't be the same scale as this. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to get, get working on that. As um, soon as that's done, we're going to be working on an aircraft carrier for us. It's something that we've been talking about for quite a while. Um, we want to do a modern attack carrier because we can have all the modern vehicles. Since most of what we do has been World War II up to this point, we want to do something a little bit different. Um, so we'll, it'll be like a modern, uh, uh, amphibious assault ship, basically. It'll have uh, uh, helicopters and uh, ospreys on the deck. It'll have a he uh, the, her the hovercraft, the LCACs, coming out the back. Um, that'll be neat, working elevators and stuff, about the size of the Missouri, uh, much taller. So this ship's about two feet tall. That ship will be about twice as, twice as tall. Wow. Three times as long, <laughs> three times as wide. So this whole island that you're looking at where we're building this on will be one big aircraft carrier. It'll be hard to walk around in here. <laughs> that will be an impressive model, so we'll look yeah. forward to that. Yeah, that's hopefully we'll get started on in the fall. So. Well, great work. Thank you so much for taking us through the ship here, Dan. Always, yeah. always love seeing your large models you guys yeah. built. Look forward in our new Schaumburg store. Uh, whenever that's open, that's when this will be appearing in the public or maybe at an event near you. You never know. Well, yeah. thank you. If, there, if, there, if there's submarines that need to be chased away, U-boats, whatever. <laughs> the, It'll you know, make an appearance. Yeah. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Matthew Green with uh, DFW Lug from Fort Worth, Texas. The bill we're talking about today is Pearl Harbor, 1941, and we want to tell the story so the kids can get a sense of history. We start with the launch of the Japanese planes from the Aircraft Carrier Strike Force. They approach through the Kalahali Pass. They then attack Pearl Harbor and Fort Island. There's a defense uh, mock showing the hero heroism of the um, sailors as they try to defend the harbor and then of course the memorial at the end to wrap up the sacrifice that they made. Mm -hmm. That's really great. So if you want to start us kind of at the beginning of the story here, what, what do we have here that, that takes us on to the attack then? Right, so the first um, part of the mock is the strike fleet. It's six aircraft carriers, two battleships, two heavy cruisers. There were ten fleet oilers and ten destroyers and most of them are depicted here. Uh, they snuck in on a rainstorm, behind a rainstorm, and launched their attack. Behind the strike fleet itself is one of the aircraft carriers, and um, could not build six of those to fit on the table, so I decided to go with the micro, micro scale instead of just the micro scale. Right, there you go. And it, so you've got the more detailed one in the back here. You want to point out some of your favorite details there and kind of how that was designed? Yeah, the thing that fascinated me about this ship was it was a converted uh, cruiser, heavy cruiser. If you'll notice the lines across the bow and how they, you can see the lines that they come across, that basically that is the line of the ship originally. Then they just dropped a box on top of it with a double hanger and a flight deck. It was um, obviously cheaper to build but poorly designed. The aircraft guns on one side couldn't support an attack on the other side. And the whole thing had a wood deck to it, so if a bomb punched through, it set up blaze all of the fuel aviation stores on the flight deck, on the um, storage decks. So, no reason, uh, no surprise that the ships went down at Midway when our dive bombers were able to, to catch them unaware. Right, exactly. So, kind of a, a little bit of a design flaw there then. So, so what do you find is kind of the, the harder parts of building at this really tiny scale here versus maybe a little bit larger scale like most builds you see? Well, you, you have to find a design feature of the piece and build off of it, whether it's the color of the flight deck, whether it's the fueling of the fleet oilers, you know, um, what, whatever you want to make be the important thing. With the heavy cruisers of the Japanese, they had all of their turreted guns on the front of the ship, the bow of the ship. So you'll notice on a cruiser, you've got a line of four turning guns on the front, well, for them to shoot directly behind them, they had to shoot through their castle. So trying to find some aspect of it that you can say, this is what's going to make this be this ship. Yeah, kind of the, the iconic part of whatever exactly. the ship is. Exactly. Okay. And then moving on around the corner here, so we've got kind of the, the next part of the story. What is this? This is the Kalahali Pass. Uh, this is where the Japanese fighters, or a group of the Japanese fighters, attacked Pearl Harbor, and uh, iconically made famous by the movie uh, Tora Tora Tora, this is where the Japanese pilot announced to back to the fleet that they had achieved surprise. They made the statements, Torah, 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 which meant we caught them by surprise. Yeah, and so the, you, again, you've got kind of the micro work here and then some cool landscaping work. I, I like you the way you build up the rocks. Now, did you incorporate some of the, the bigger rock pieces from Lego in there? I did, I did. There's burps and lerps in there. <laughs> So, you know, th those do have uses if you just need, like, a large area, you know, and don't want to go super piece heavy, then they are useful for that. As long as you um, hide them somewhat with additional pieces so that they're not totally uniform. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So then we move on down to what I think is the, the biggest section of the whole layout here. Yeah, this is Fort Island and the uh, harbor itself. You've got Pearl City on the top left corner. You've got Fort Island, of course, with the landing field on it. You've got Hospital Point, which is where the Nevada ended up when he tried to make its run for the sea. You've got the, the naval base. There's a small housing subdivision that was between the naval base and the submarine base. Then you've got the submarine base and the storage oil tankers. Um, surprisingly enough, the sub base and the oil tankers were not even hit in the attack, which is a little surprising. Yeah. If we knocked out the fuel, the ships couldn't go anywhere. So a little surprising. That's interesting, yeah. And then you've got kind of the whole, is this the, the big ship, kind of battleship row type of stuff there? Yeah, battleship row, and then you've got the other ships. And the ships are where they were on that morning, taken from photographs of that day. So the hospital ship uh, is, Mercy, it's where it was. The um, destroyers and destroyer escorts are where they were tied up at. Um, 
everything is as realistic as I can make it based on based on research. Right, and uh, when you're looking into this stuff, do you find that there's there's pretty good photos and things like that to to base your your builds off of? A lot of photos and also a lot of drawings. A lot of drawings. Yeah, there's a lot of, of sketches of where each ship was located at, and then there may have been photos from two days before or three days after that can help me with design. Very nice. And then moving on down here again, we've got kind of a, is this a section of one of the ships yeah, here? This will be a section of one of the ships, and it's not of a particular ship. They probably wouldn't put their anti-aircraft guns that close together. But the idea was just to show the heroism of the men trying to fight. The sea was actually on fire. You had sailors in the water with um, fire all around them. And at the same time, sailors on the ships were trying to shoot down the planes before they could strafe their buddies in the water. Okay. And was that from like oil in the water? Is that is that how? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was from ruptured uh, fuel tanks on the ships or ships that had capsized. Tennessee actually rolled over, so or the Oklahoma. The Oklahoma actually rolled over, and when it rolled over, of course, oil that was in it leaked out, just like an oil tanker would. The uh, Valdez, Exxon Valdez did. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of nice to get the, the closer up view of the the ship there then as well. And then finally, I think we have the memorial down here. Finally, we have the memorial, the Arizona Memorial. And if you look closely, you can see the Arizona itself under the water. So tried to do a, the translucent pieces so that folks could know that there was actually a ship under there. The two forward turrets are visible, one above the water, one just below the water. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, if you kind of look at it from the air, you can see the actual ship still underneath Absolutely. there, right? On a, on a clear day when there's not too much traffic <laughs> in the harbor. <laughs> There you go. Well, this is this is a great series of builds. What do you find is the reaction when you do historical builds like this, particularly mili military related builds? What is the general reaction from public and people who look at these when you display it? A lot of people will look to their parents or grandparents that have served in the military and it's a chance for them to honor them. I actually have some kids that will educate their parents on this is what happened because they had studied this in school recently and there'll be times when a, a young man or, or lady will spend 20 minutes here going through the whole story with their parent pointing out everything and you know, showing what they learned in school. Yeah, that's really great, and you're able to kind of incorporate the, the families then like that, get people involved in the builds when they, when they can see those stories. Yeah, I was at a show in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I had a gentleman come up in a wheelchair, and he had actually served in Pearl Harbor, and he pointed to the ship that he actually served on. <laughs> and you talk about a chilling moment. That was, uh, that was just way cool to have met somebody who was actually there on that day. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. So are there, are there any more plans to expand the story even more at this point? Or I'd like to do a, a mock of the radar installation, which should have given us early warning, but we didn't pay attention because it was early technology, and the guy that answered the phone with the report was not an early adopter. <laughs> and then I'd like to do something that would show the nurses' efforts. I mean, the nurses literally came off the street in their street clothes and started helping people, and I would like to show something that um, pays homage to their their efforts. Yeah, well, I think you did a great job telling, telling the story here so far. Really impressive. So I appreciate you taking us through that. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the time to talk about it. My name's Dan Siskin, and I'm here to talk about the USS Nicholas. It's a Fletcher class destroyer um, built out of Lego, uh, 135th scale. Um, so it's a pretty large scale build. Um, basically, do 135th scale because I do mostly do tanks. All of them are 135th okay. scale. Wanted to build a ship to match. Um, so this is a Fletcher class destroyer from World War II. Um, the actually was the first ship completed of the Fletcher class. Um, beat the actual uh, Fletcher USS Fletcher by by a short <laughs> short amount of time. Um, so this is a. Uh, I chose to build this ship because uh, the USS Nicholas was the honor escort of the USS Missouri into Tokyo Bay um, for the signing of the surrender documents ending the war. Um, so this model is about 11 feet long. Um, I'm guessing there's about 150,000 bricks in here. Um, it's traveled around extensively. It doesn't travel well. This was my this was my warm up build. I was going to build the USS Missouri, um, and I wanted to experiment. I never built anything this big uh, with this sort of like hull shaping, and wanted to see how well it traveled, how how well the construction was going to work out. Learned a lot of lessons in this ship. Uh, it, it's, it's gone in a couple car accidents or near near car accidents, is, um, and it's had to be rebuilt several times. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's a really great chip. And I noticed you got the the lighting on there, sure. and you know, are these uh, minifigs uh, custom that you made yourself? 
They are, but you can't tell. They're they're wearing they're wearing uh, life jackets, yeah, but they are they are custom printed okay. figures. Here, I can pull pull sure. one apart here. Um, so if I can get them off the ship. <laughs> here, I'll take one of these guys. So, you know, kind of have the luxury at Brick Mania when we we want to get our own guys printed, we actually get a local pad printer to do it. But so these are custom printed U.S. Navy sailors. So U.S. Navy dungarees. This is actually our first generation. We have a newer version of it out now. Um, but we do we do sailors we do them for the navy we do them for museums oh, okay. so so these are these are our own our own product actually yeah um, very nice of course, of course brick arms helmets the, the the vest is a lego standard lego piece um, so everything on here except for the helmets is is official lego the lights are not though they're from brick stuff so I have to mention them because they they graciously gave us the lights to to, to light the ship up and program the morris code and the signal lamp for us mm-hmm. so yeah, and those lights make it, you know, really just that much neater, you know, when you see those Sure, lights. sure. We have lights. We have a whole bunch more lights we're going to add to this. So all the other things that you see on here will all light up just uh, eventually. You know, there's there's always a back. I have I have more more ambition to build than I have time. So <laughs> uh, one of these days I'll get this thing back into into the workshop and, and re-rig it to put the rest of the lights on. Okay. And what's the inside of this like as far as kind of the upper areas? Uh, is there a lot of just support pieces in there? You didn't build any of like the actual rooms or anything like no, that? No, yeah, this, it's, it's just kind of built on a frame. Okay. I, I, I learned my lesson, built, built this one. It's a, it's a Technic frame, basically the same way like a, like a snake or something works. It has a central spine, central keel, and then ribs that come around. Um, I learned the hard way that's not a good way. It may, maybe it works in steel, but it doesn't work in Lego that well. <laughs> so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this comes. It looks like there's there's what about four or five sections this yep. comes apart into. This, this this is this is built in four sections. I, I've learned the hard way. You have to build to uh, doors and vehicles. You, if you can't uh, if you can't fit it through a door, probably shouldn't build it. Yeah. And if you can't fit it in a vehicle, you can't take it with you somewhere. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. got to make sure you can take it around and display it shows and things. Yep. So this one's I think there's four sections of about three feet each. Okay. And is the what's the the toughest part of putting together a ship like this for you? Is there you know little details that you like to put on, or what? How's that work for you? Well, this one the toughest part is to get that deck to slope. So you have bricks going in multiple directions. So the deck is sloping. It's you know the, the hull is curved, curved, and it's starting you know just just from traveling. It's 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 separating. So making it structurally sound and keeping all the the right shapes that's the hardest part. Mm-hmm. Um, the de- the little details they're the fun parts they're to the me. Fun part. Those are those are fun. <laughs> they're easy, and I usually don't get to do that until after the the main components are done. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's really neat. Thanks for taking us through that. Oh, you're welcome. I'm Jim Butte, uh, Hard Luck Nerd. Uh, this is my take on the Fletcher class destroyer. Uh, so, quick history: Fletcher was uh, our our latest and greatest destroyer uh, when World War II came and found us. So it it had all the the most current weapons and sensors and other stuff on it. So. It was pretty successful. Uh, she was a lot bigger than previous destroyers, uh, so she was very successful that way too. She was survivable, and she had room to grow when, when they took it into the Pacific and they realized how uh, tenacious the Japanese pilots were. They like tripled the anti-aircraft stuff they put on them. So a good boat, uh, lasted a long time. We made like 175 of them, uh, and they stuck around for a while because they had room to grow. So a lot of folks, I've had come, people come to the show, and, yeah, I was on a Fletcher in, in Vietnam. And they say, yeah, I slept there, but they took this off. They modernized it and all that. Uh, I, maybe I guess give you a quick tour of the ship. Uh, he's, he's going up from aft. Uh, back aft, there's a, there's a couple of 5-inch guns. Uh, they go back around. That's their main battery. Uh, behind them are the depth charges. Uh, the, and and uh, between those guns, there's actually a ship maneuvering station where they could have a secondary bridge and drive the boat from there. Lots of anti-aircraft guns. Um, midships, there were torpedo launchers. Um, so I've got them fired up, and uh, there were quintip, quintuple launchers. Um, I sacrificed uh, accuracy. Oops, ah, I'm having stage fright. I sacrificed accuracy for uh, fun, and I actually made them firing launchers. So instead of five static ones, I have two uh, firing. Hey guys, you want to catch a torpedo? Fire one. Oh. Fire two. <laughs> so I've got I've got a pair of, of firing darts, and, and that's a, that's a crowd pleaser. The the kids like that, and they'll, they'll come and, and play with that. That's fantastic. I love the playability there. Well, yeah, it's a, it can be a menace sometimes when you've got a line of kids that want to come. In. Okay, shoot me next. Shoot me next. So I put some hand sanitizer out there. So. Um, anyways, um, so uh, it was a typical ship with uh, two engine rooms, uh, so two smokestacks, and that was a that was a handy spot. Those smokestacks each have two of these infrared controllers in them, 
um, or infrared receivers in them. So I've got four channels of fun here. So uh, I, I can just sit back here with this handset and, and, and so, okay, channel one, channel two, and, and drive the different guns. So and again, up forward, uh, above the bridge, there's the fire control director, and that's in this one linked up to those two guns. Um, and that's a quick and dirty overview of a Fletcher class destroyer. Um, the build, if I may, uh, it's a uh, yeah, snot built sideways, uh, that technique we've talked about before where you use tiles down the sides to get that graceful curve. Um, uh, most of the, the superstructure is snot built. Um, it, ship comes apart in, in two pieces. The front two thirds of the ship is actually an inclined plane. It's a, it ramps up the whole way. So I've got a seam along the side here that hides that step function where the, the ship gets taller as it gets towards the front. Um, the ship itself is in the water, and again, more people like the water than the boat here, it seems. Uh, the, the more thoughtful people come up and say, hey, your ship is rocking and rolling, and it's, you know, it's got a wake and all that. Uh, the ship uh, is pretty rigid when I put it together, and it sits on a cradle of Technic beams, uh, and I've, I've positioned those so that it leans to the right. So she's rolling to the right, and she's pitching upward, and that, that makes it a little more fun to uh, destroy her in her natural habitat. And then I kind of build the ocean around her. It's uh, just a bunch of garbage rainbow brick underneath there, um, and then a thin layer of blue on top to, to give it a, a rolling ocean look. Uh, and then I end up with some unsightly seams where the, the blue water meets the boat, and I just kind of hide that with this, this white spray. And when kind-hearted people show up and they're not looking for gaps, they're looking for cool boats. They see the cool boat, and they don't see my gaps. Anyways, that's me running at the mouth. Um, anything that you want to talk about above and beyond that? Yeah, this is fantastic. So I don't know if I've ever seen a ship displayed like this with the water kind of built into it like that and then the ship kind of laying in the base. So what are some of the challenges of that? And kind of, I know you said you've got you've got to hide the gaps, but ugly, ugly gaps. Be, besides that, are there any other challenges kind of incorporating that all together? Not really. What I found, um, so I, again, I've got the big pieces of the, of the water and then alongside each, uh, again, underneath my gap, um, there's a small piece that I know, okay, and I've labeled them, okay, that's, you know, starboard number four. That goes in there to, to make that big gap smaller, and then it's small enough that I can hide it with just a strip of something sitting over top of it. Um, other than that, uh, my, my waves aren't perfect, my wakes aren't perfect. I had a naval architect in here saying, oh, they should really angle a little more. <laughs> okay, hey, but they're pretty and I like them, so that's that's the... There's always the critics coming through. That's the M and mock, buddy. But uh, no, um, so that's, it's not a hard technique to do. It, it just requires you to have a whole lot of blue on hand, so that's, that's about it. Um, and if you can, take us through some more of the details on the ship here, and I don't know if you're able to show inside kind of any of the, uh, what you did there. In fact, uh, yeah, I'll get you under the hood a little bit. So, again, channel four is these aft guns. Uh, you can move those back and forth. Under the hood, if I can, it's some pretty straightforward. There's just a, one motor, and I can take the next level of this stuff off. Um, there's just a simple motor for each of these sets of things. Oh, the gun's got to go off first. Um, but they're linked together. So, you know, one motor drives, and I've taken that one motor, and it's driving a, you know, a gun mount here, a gun mount back aft, and because the, 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 the mount on the fantail is so down below the, the deck level, it, there's a vertical axle that goes to another gear train that goes to another gear train that comes up to the gun mount. So there's some shenanigans there to try to get three guns to work uh, from one motor. The torpedo tubes were the fun part. Um, it was just a blast to try to solve the problem of how do you fit that into the space you've got. Um, so what I've got, uh, let me go back to the channel for this, um, is wired up so there's a simple motor uh, on a worm gear so I can turn the mount all the way around, if it's gonna behave there. So I can turn the mount all the way around and then a servo motor is mounted on the axis of that and that, that little green and red thing there is effectively my firing pin and when that pushes on the back of my actual torpedo tube with those little darts on there, I can get the whole fire one, fire two thing. And with two mounts of that, I got four darts I can shoot at the kids and keep them entertained. Um, but as you look down in, in the hull here, the, the stack is, is the, and again, you can see under there, you can see a little bit of the structure that holds them in place. And it's a big hollow cavernous shell because I've got to fit a battery pack and this, this uh, smokestack thing that, as you can see, it's built around those IR receivers. And then all that junk, it's got to fit in there. And as, as we discussed before, when you, when you put that much motion in, most of the interior of your ship is filled up with wires and batteries and all, receivers and all that other junk. 
Uh, it's probably more than you wanted, but... Uh, oh, no, that's excellent. It's great to see the behind the scenes of it all because it's one thing to see the turrets turning, but then to see how this actually all happens and how you're able to incorporate that into still making the ship look as fantastic as it does. Well, well thank you very much. Those are, those are kind words, and, it, and it's a blast to do this kind of stuff. So, if I'm not mistaken, I think some of these Fletcher-class destroyers have survived as, like, museum ships today. So what was the research like on this, and is this based on, like, one specific ship, or...? <laughs> Well, we had 175 of them, so so pick your ship, and that's that's what it is. This is the USS Smith, or, or what? No, uh, yeah, we, we had a bunch of them. There's a there's a handful that are still museum ships. There's like one up in Boston, uh, Case and Young, I think. Uh, the kid is down in like Baton Rouge, and she still kind of looks like this. She's a she's a 1940s vintage, you know, museum ship, and it's glorious to have those around. Um, I was fortunate enough. These are you know these are well documented. So there's there's plans, there's model kits, and uh, we've talked before. My my standard mo is I ask my wife for a small model of the Fletcher for Christmas, and I'll just use that to keep my dimensions and proportions about right. Um, so not a real hard thing for for actual researching it. There's there's plenty of sources out there. Uh, I'm I'm trying a Civil War ironclad next time, and that one's that one's proving to be very hard because there are no drawings for some of the stuff I'm I'm looking to show. But anyways, so this one, piece of cake, is the short answer. There's lots of good stuff out there. And the, with all these moving parts inside, does that tend to stay running pretty well throughout a whole show, or are you kind of getting inside this thing sometimes to fix it? Or? I learned from a, a few builds that didn't work. <laughs> these, these, these guys work pretty good. I had to make some compromises with these, with these torpedo tubes. Um, they will shake loose after several hours, but, yeah, it's like once a show i got to go in, and, and it's, I just got to you know, pop a pin back in, and, and then they go. Uh, so they're not bad. The worst part are these life rails. They're a little bit fragile. I hate life rails. The ship doesn't look right without them, and there's not a good way to do them right. So you kind of do them as, as least wrong as you can and, and hope for the best and hope nobody notices. But no, the, the motors, they're, they're, they're working okay for me. And obviously when you're, when you're building a ship like this based on a real-life ship, especially in an area like Washington, D.C. with a lot of like military presence, uh, what have been some of the, the comments and some of the, the public reactions as, as this has been on display? Oh, the, yeah, the Navy guys love it. Uh, again, when, when, the, when the old surface warfare guys come around, they can hear that. They, they look at the bow and they say, yeah, I know what that sounds like. I, I can hear it right now. Uh, they like it. Uh, they, and again, they stuck around long enough. There's actually, as I said, there's some guys that have served on these Fletchers and say, yeah, you nailed it. It looks great. And they, they wanted to talk to me about where their stateroom was and, and, you know, all this stuff. So they're generally like it. And it, pretty much any old Navy guy like myself, yeah, we love looking at ships and let's talk about ships for a while. So it, it's, it's, so it's a blast. It's a good conversation starter with the veterans that come around here and, and, and do that. Love it. When you're working on something like this, do you have any idea how many pieces are in this whole layout? Absolutely none. <laughs> and that's the question people always ask you, of course. And you got to say, oh, I don't know, several thousand. And if you're counting, you, you probably shouldn't be, you know. All right, my name's uh, Eric Larson. Uh, I built a Type 7C German U boat. Would have been, I copied the Bergen U dry dock in Norway. So we made a historical build of it, uh, included details. We put lights in there. We've got a welder working on his dive plane. Um, kind of to show why that they would be in a dry dock. We've concluded a couple Craig's Marine, a couple uh, military there. Um, one of the hidden gems we have for people to find is in door number two there. We've got Indiana Jones, kind of recreating the scene from the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. Talk about the design of the sub itself, because you've got a lot of tough angles and kind of slope parts of this build that are hard to capture. Tough angles, and I'm not really 100% still happy with it, particularly where it boat comes back into the boat. It's really hard to get the bricks, and I was working to the last minute and getting what I felt looked good for that, uh, and also the front. I'm still really not 100%. I want to get it a little bit better because I like to be a little more historically accurate. I am really happy with the tail, the tail design, the end design I got by, you know, comboing this and then capping it in so I could get the tails to where it looks exactly the way I want. So still work in progress, but I wanted to unleash it here at Brick Fair so people could see it. And it particularly looked good at the, the night when we closed all the lights off at night. So yeah. how did you incorporate all those lights in there? Uh, I tied them through the back with, with battery packs. They're tied in. There are four, four that go in through the back of the build. And then we put lights in the top. These originally were doors until Friday, but we made these rooms once we saw they were going to do the light show so that you could kind of see and see some of the details inside the rooms. So. And the lights are really easy to work with, too. You just have to be real careful when you're putting the wire between the studs. Now, 
Did you find kind of blueprints or records of the historical building and scene that you were depicting here? I did, yeah, I did. I didn't want to do the su submarine pens that were in France because I've seen a lot of people do those. So what people don't talk a lot about is the war in the Arctic Circle. So we, I wanted to do something that was one of the Norwegian pens, and we copy, I copied in the Bruno pen in Bergen, Norway. So it's a pretty good copy of that, uh, the dry dock there. Yeah. And is there any kind of uh, internal parts to the submarine, or is that just kind of structure to keep it all together? There are internals, but I can't. It's on the other side of the boat, unfortunately. But next year, I'll turn it around so I can take the front off so I can show people. So there is an interior that will be revealed next year. We'll probably add on to it and make a wet pen and a dry pen so it's the width of the table for next year's Brick Fair. And then talk about some of the character designs you have in here, some of the minifigures. Where did you source those from? Many figures are made, a lot of brick mania. I do have brick fabric. There's a, there's a gentleman in Russia who makes the fabric figures that I use, but it's basically brick mania, minifig co, and brick fabric I'm using a lot more of. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent build. And then I think the smaller vignettes in front of here is actually your son built these, right? Yes, my son and I work on Lego together as a hobby, and he has built all of these Jeeps on his own. So, and they depict different parts of the war. So go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, and then you can take us through these. Uh, my name is Gunnar Larson, and pretty much it's just the timeline of the Willys Jeep. So first here we got the being built in the factory with the woman, since all the men were at war. So just got them working on the Jeep on the conveyor belt. Then after that, we got them in testing. So we kind of recreated a famous picture there of it in testing. Uh, and then we have it being used by the Desert Rats and their Jeep. So they're just kind of taking a break right now. A little tea break there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we got it on D-Day, just a medical Jeep. Some injured guys there. Um, yeah, it's all really there. Operation Market Garden with the SAS Jeep. And a German about to blow the bridge down there, actually. Some explosives down there, too. Uh, this actually has working lights, if I can turn those on right now. Um, there we go. We just wired those up last night, so. That's great. You could fit lights in such a small vehicle. That's really cool. Yes, it was very frustrating. <laughs> then we got a military police jeep in Bastogne here with some 101st Airborne guys walking next to it. And, yeah, that's kind of all that one has. Patton. In his command car, this is not actually a Willys Jeep, um, just a command car. Decided I'd put it in here anyways, because made it last second. Um, then after that, we got the amphibious Willys Jeep and Pacific against the Japanese with some Marines kind of around. And yeah, that is what I've done here. That's great, and I love I love these these vignettes because it shows how versatile some of these vehicles during the Second World War were, and how they they sent them all over the world during the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this has been really popular. This has been really popular with people seeing the women on the home front. That's been the most photographed of all the Jeeps. So, he just turned ten for Brick Fair, so it was a good good birthday present to come out and show all the, his Jeeps off. So it's been a lot of fun. Well, thank you guys. Keep up the great work together. Look forward to seeing more from both of you in the future. Thank right. you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robert Severs, and today I have for you the USS Juliet. A World War II inspired aircraft carrier that I was able to design myself, taking tidbits from the Nimitz and other different classes of aircraft carriers. On this ship right here, on this build, I have uh, 31 smaller anti-aircraft vehicles and uh, a few of a uh, dual purpose 75 millimeter cannons right here in the box. Right here, and I have a uh, about 19 ships and uh, 19 planes that I have built on the ship, they're uh, Corsairs. And I was going to do them in blue like they are in real life, but some of the parts didn't exist in this, uh, the blue that was needed, so I looked it up and they did come in gray with a white underbelly of this ship. So take us through the design process of the ship where, and where you started with this. Where I started was from, I always start from the front of the ship and kind of make that angle and then I kind of like uh, go out and out and I kind of just stretch in. I have to make it modular just for transportation reasons. And I basically, it's kind of simple, but I kind of just stretch it out among the two parts. And then I continue working on the back kind of coming into it a little bit. And then I just build up and up, build up and out, I guess, and while adding like uh, in one by two inverted slopes. And... You know, I just basically then I you know kind of structure it on the inside, kind of like a like a roof to a house where you have lines coming across and then you're coming along flat. So it's nice and structurally sound on this one. And for the kind of barrier railing pieces here, you've actually done some kind of uh, you know studs out almost 
technique building. So how are those attached? Uh, I kind of do it like the, uh, <laughs> I got a lot of people frowning at me for this, but the uh, legal building technique where you can put along here, you can put it on kind of halfway through here. You simply take it off right here and you kind of put it along the middle around here and you put it on. It's kind of a little tricky, but it stays on if you get in and you can even put it on along an angle if you have like an angled piece. It's nice and you know, even curve and stuff like that. And have a, I have the same style coming around where you kind of don't know the name of the part, but you can kind of come along. You can put with the angle, you can come along and put like a little box on the sides. So you're just, you know, using the studs to their full advantage. Yes, I kind of have to for this style. You know, I was trying to, you know, add something to it because you know, you can't just add guns. People are going to fall off the ship if it, you know, lurches too much to one side. But yeah, and I don't have enough. I don't have uh, enough parts that uh, completely flatten it, so I kind of do that, you know, stud style about that. Would you like to tile the whole thing eventually? Yeah, I would, but I don't have the money required for that type of thing. It's a, it's really nice. But I always do this uh, classic style. I get a lot of compliments saying, "Well, you, I see you use a lot of bricks and you use the studs." It's a, the classic style, especially the older fans seem to. Really enjoy it because you know some people you know love to see the thin, uh, thin it out, and I like to have it more bumpy and make it more like Lego-ish type of something. And what do we have in the middle section here? It is the Citadel where I have right here. It's basically the command and communications tower. Uh, I have some defenses right here. I have a kind of a sight box where they could uh, a targeting box where they could come and see, you know, where they can aim the guns. I have some radar systems right here. Kind of have like this little. Uh, you know, kind of like a point defense, uh, not point defense, but kind of like a, I guess like a made up plane detector type of thing and uh, some more radar, have some rigging up here. I've got my style of sloped uh, smoke houses right here. I have a, I saw this online of the flag right here. I thought it was a really cool idea. I have some rigging. I have a few more anti-craft boxes along here and yeah, some really cool stuff. Uh, all black radar, which is nice. That I was able to get. And I found that little piece right there in black, that little T piece, T connector at the last minute in black, which is nice. I even have a somewhat working elevator right here where you can come along the sides and you can come on, kind of lower it a little bit. It was kind of a rush job on the top part. But you come along here and kind of angle it up, kind of like a garage door almost type of thing. And I have a, it, it doesn't move at the moment, but I have something I plan to move it in the future where it's a kind of like an uh, elevator. And that was the, kind of the style in the 30s that they would do. Well, they kind of, they eventually, I think they got rid of it. It was like during like the Langley time when they first invented that. They just improved upon it. But like I said, this is my own design, taking inspiration from other ships. So it didn't exist. The, the USS Julia did not exist. But uh, World War II style and feel, I even have a, some larger guns right here. You know, some extra point defense. And the goal was it, the goal of it was to kind of have the armament of a small cruiser to kind of defend itself. Of course, an aircraft carrier wouldn't go by itself, but yeah, to have some point defense stuff. How long is the whole ship? Uh, to even it out, I'd say about nine feet long. It probably weighs a good 150 pounds, probably 150 pounds probably. And I have about 7,000 pieces of which, of which about 3,000 were light blue gray two by fours. Mostly it goes in the middle though, so it's structurally really, really sound. It's just, you know, Heavy. <laughs> and is it kind of modular when you set this up at a show? Yes, it is uh, modular. It comes in four parts. We actually, my dad and I, we actually bought, uh, built four crates just to transport the thing. And we have a small car, so it's kind of crammed almost the entire you know, space of the back seat and the trunk and all that jazz. But, you know, yeah, the crates have enough to where all I have to do is take some of the stuff off the rigging and it <laughs> fits in perfectly. And I, I can fit another mock on top since it has pretty much flat space. and takes a little while to set up, but yeah, it transports pretty well. Great. Well, it's, it's a, a great looking build, a very impressive size. I love that you're able to, to continue to expand on your ships. I know we've covered some in past years, and it's always great to see what you bring here, so thank you. Yeah, this is the third year I've brought ships, and I plan on continuing bringing more. I'm known as the, the ship guy or the gray guy at my lug group. So yeah, like, oh, you're bringing another ship this year, huh? Or another tank or whatever, yeah. So yeah, it's it's yeah, it's really nice to be known for something, and I have several fans coming along here. Some uh, uh, that really seem to enjoy my work. Like, oh, what ship are you bringing this year? That looks great, you know, and stuff like that. Well, I hope you keep up the good work. Then, thank you so much. Thank you for interviewing me. Thank you. I'm Evan Goodsell. This is my battleship, the Nagato. She was Admiral Yamamoto's flagship during the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. 
she served as the pretty much the flagship for the Japanese Navy from her construction in 1919 until uh, the construction of the Yamato in 1941. At which point she was relegated to uh, secondary service until 1946, no, 1945, when the war ended. Uh, used as a test ship for the Bikini Atoll tests. Okay. Uh, so yeah, some, some great history there. Take us through the design process then and kind of how the ship came together for you. Well, uh, I started because I just wanted to build a big ship. And so I started at the, the front of the ship and I started branching out. And working up, and I decided, you know, I'm going to build a battleship. Because I was originally going to build a carrier, and I said, no, I'm going to build a battleship instead. Uh, and then I couldn't decide which one to build, because there's, there's so many cool battleships. And then I eventually landed on Nagato, because she's my favorite. Uh, and so she was originally going to be six feet long. It, evidently, she grew, because uh, I realized she looked really stubby. And that was not good. So then I made her longer, and making her longer made her too, uh, not tall enough. So then I had to make her taller. Uh, and so far that's been working out pretty well. Uh, I still need to put lighting in and the turrets are unpowered still. They need to be powered. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of, uh, exposed, um... Studs? Studs, yeah. A lot of exposed studs on the sides that still need to get covered up. And it's a bit square, and I'd, I'd kind of like to change that in the future. So is it still kind of a work in progress for you then? Oh yeah, absolutely. So can you spin the turrets at the moment? Uh, yeah. All the turrets spin, although some of them don't like to. <laughs> That's how it always is, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so you've got kind of the bottom layer here, and then as you go up uh, towards the highest section, it kind of builds up there. So what's the structure like on the inside? Uh, confused. <laughs> uh, at the bottom, uh, for the hull, it is a very clear uh, line straight down the middle for a spine with walls branching out the sides. And then as it goes up, it starts becoming pillars and uh, hangovers and other sorts of pieces just to keep the deck from caving in. Yeah, so when you bring it to a show, does it stay pretty sturdy here and you just get it set up and it works fine? Well, for the most part, it stays sturdy. A few pieces, loose pieces, might, uh, might come off, which is normal, this is to be expected. Um, and then, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's pretty sturdy. Sometimes pieces will separate, pieces fall off, uh, the barrels don't stay on the turrets. Uh, yeah, it's pretty sturdy. You've got some great photos of the battleship here, what it looked like in real life. So talk about the process of translating those photos into the actual build here. Well, uh, well I, I opened it up in a few different 3D modeling programs first to try to get a, a feel of how it would look in cube form. Uh, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, so I started building, and it became too narrow. And then I had to go back in and I had to check my measurements. And then I realized I was using actual cubes. And Lego bricks are not cubes as <laughs> it turns out. So then I had to say, okay, I need to add every three blocks, I need to add another one, because they're not quite cubes. So then that actually worked out really well. Uh, and so then I, I go in my programs and I, open, and I build a little bit more, and then I come here and I build a little bit more. And then I did that for the entirety of the hull and the smokestack. And then the rest of it I just built by hand, just free built. Yeah, and just kind of comes together naturally after that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking us through the build here. It's very, very impressive looking here, taking up like this whole end of the table. So I look forward to seeing more updates from you in the future. Thank you. Absolutely. I can't wait to see you in the future as well. I'm Cody Osell. I work for Brickmania. And I'm going to talk about this Omaha beach display. Uh, one of the beachheads of Normandy Beach in France. Um, this is a display that took about a month to build just the beach portion of it. Um, the LST is a landing craft, um, so this would be D-Day plus one, because um, the LST would not be this close to shore um, on D-Day itself, because there's a risk of the ship getting destroyed. <laughs> yes. From the naval guns. Yes. Um, so this is just a scene of all the vehicles being unloaded from the LST and from smaller ships, um, delivering tanks, ammunition, personnel, um, jeeps, trucks cannons, all the fun stuff that you need to win a war. Um, our water is just um, pieces of Lego. It's just one by one round um, plates, blue, light blue, uh, clear. And where does one source this quantity of one by one trans clear parts? Um, that I'm sure we bought. Um, I wasn't in the process 
I wasn't involved in the process. So this is the, the beauty of working for Brickmania is that you just happen to have the enormous quantity of uh, elements suitable for use as water. We do. Um, we also get a lot of donations, and a lot of these um, ships and vehicles. I know the beach for sure. That was built with just a lot of donation Lego. Um, people donate to us. That's awesome. You know, it's going to a good cause. Awesome things will be built. Yeah, so we're, we're thankful that people donate so we don't have to spend as much money <laughs> building mocks definitely, like this. Definitely. And uh, run us through uh, some of the vehicles we're looking at on the top of the, uh, the little ship here. Um, Not so little ship here. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we have some Jeeps and we have Jeeps with canopies. And we have custom Deuce canopies? Yes, custom canopies. Um, I think it was a guy in Australia, I've been told, made those canopies um, and is no longer making them. Oh. Um, so we can't sell the canopies anymore. Um, and then we have Deuce and a Half trucks. Um, towing anti-aircraft guns, um, some howitzer cannons, anti-tank cannons. Um, that's just what's on the ship itself right now. Um, we have some M4 Shermans on this landing craft, and they have these swamp, uh, like snorkels. So they drive through swamps and the tank, uh, the engines can still breathe. So like, like this makes, it, that, that's a little less sad, like, it, that's fine. It's yeah. not going to like ruin the... No, it, it won't ruin. The, the engine in the Sherman is in, in the back. Very good, very good. And what kind of reference materials do you guys uh, look at? What's like your single greatest source? Is there like a particular archive site that you guys uh, find to be very, very good or some sort of uh, press photos? Um, Dance Diskin has a very large library of military vehicles and schematics, and he actually has some blueprints that he designs his vehicles from. Well, how about that? <laughs> That's pretty cool. And uh, what, what are we looking at here, uh, the beach scene? Um, well, this would be at low tide, okay. um, and you can see there are some beach obstacles that the Germans would put in place. Um, basically, what you're seeing here is just logs with mines on the ends of them. So at high tide, when they were hoping that we would land, um, the ships and things would hit these and explode and not be able to land on the beach. Sneaky, sneaky. Yeah, and they, they also put logs going this way, and they would have mines laying on top of the logs. Um, but we figured it would be best to disassemble them. To, for D-Day plus one, um, we have bulldozers pushing the um, obstacles into some craters that were made from naval guns, just kind of cleaning up the beach, getting room for the vehicles. Um, we kind of have a POW camp set okay, up. Okay, that's what I was thinking, okay. Because um, we had a lot of Germans, and we didn't know what to do with them all, so we just figured we would put them in a line, surrendering. Is this, is this like a realistic occurrence? Um, yes. So that, that is amazing to kind of just to look at that, to think about what that means and what that signifies. Uh, just uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, there probably wouldn't have has been this many Germans. Um, they probably would have been fleeing back um, farther into France. Yeah. <laughs> um, but hey, this is a pretty cool outcome, I guess. Uh, we're speaking from like an uh, American perspective at this time. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Very cool, very cool. And then moving on down here, uh, what are we looking at uh, towards this direction? Is that a, uh, like a medic unit? Uh, yes. Well, if you notice, um, these are very iconic. Um, these obstacles here, I don't know if if you have seen um, Saving Private Ryan. That's that like a total thing. I think I, I'm not really even too much of a military builder myself, but I myself have built like six or seven of these for like a weird sure. scene that I did. And, and you, your technique for building them is also unique. You're not using just like a Travis brick with a bunch of bricks sticking out on the ends. You have some nice tiles. Right. Um, well, I can't claim uh, all of this stuff. Um, you see Kasowitz, um is also the builder. He was... He's been at Brickmania longer than I have, and he came up with the design for these hedgehogs and a lot of the beach obstacles. Shouts out to him. Very nice, very nice. Uh, how many people would you say are like responsible for all of the builds on this uh, table? Maybe there's too many to name because we're taking into account vehicles and stuff, but like this build, how many people like directly involved would you say? Um, I would say three okay. um, most directly involved. Um, so uh, yourself? Myself, I built um, most of the cliffs and I built the bunkers the German bunkers, the gun emplacement, um, and a majority of the beach itself. Um, some of it was repurposed. Uh, the LST was part of an older display um, in the Battle of Peleliu in the Pacific, yeah. um, and we just kind of modified it and made it Normandy Beach. Sand is sand? France. Yeah, sand is sand. Um, and if you notice, I don't know if you can tell with your camera, but the beach is sloping down yeah. gradually. Um, what does the understructure look like? Well, the understructure is mostly hollow. Okay. Um, Dan Siskin developed a technique. These are all built on 48 by 48 um, stud base plates. And then we put them together with Technic um, axles. 
That's so, awesome. so we can transport it, we can put it in boxes, um, and it's strong. Uh, he built kind of a internal structure is a honeycomb pattern. Um, so we call it with uh, two by four bricks and two by two bricks kind of stacked on each other. That's so they super cool. In all the sides and it's very strong. You can stand on these and it won't break. Really? That is impressive. And, and you can also like toss them into a van and drive halfway across the country and put it on this place somewhere. Yep. Yeah. It, ha it hasn't broken yet. So <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And then I guess to kind of round us out here, let's take a look at uh, these fortifications. What, what are we looking at here? Um, well, these are... I basically based this one off of, it is historically accurate, but I based it off of the movie Saving Private Ryan because everyone knows um, this one. If you've seen the movie, they, they attack it and then they come up through the trenches and a guy takes a flamethrower and, you know, burns everybody inside of it. <laughs> well, how about that? Um, so I made this, so if we ever do a D-Day, we can put machine gunners in here. That's cool. And it'll just like snap, that is super slick that it just kind of pops off like that. Yeah, I want, I want to make it strong and simple enough so whoever sets this up because i'm not going to travel every time um with this definitely so, definitely so that someone else can kind of easily put this together relatively easily and it even comes out like that wow and that, there's kind of a, a view of the honeycomb pattern i was talking about oh, I see. and we just use whatever color bricks we can because it's on the inside yeah, whatever's available very cool and uh i think there are some pretty neat details on the back side of said hill or incline uh what do we have on the back here well, on the back here, um, kind of more of a last-minute decision. A last-minute decision was uh, to put some caves on the back side, um, some tunnels, some concrete tunnels. Um, we have a map room there, um, kind of depicting like how the Germans would plan out how to defend. Beat those pesky Americans. Yeah, those pesky Americans. Pesky English, pesky French. Ugh. Yeah. Canadian. Didn't work out, unfortunately, but... I, I love this. It's very meta. Very meta. That's what I thought. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it definitely is. And it's kind of, um, I put a wine cellar in the base. Uh, maybe you can see it from that side. Uh, we kind of like to add humor. I doubt there would be any wine cellars um, on Normandy. One can hope. Yeah, you know, maybe a general or a major wanted a wine cellar. Um, awesome. But kind of a map room in there also um, underneath that. Uh, gun emplacement. Very cool, very cool. C Cody, thank you so much for sharing with us. Wonderful build and uh, wonderful contributions by everyone involved. My name is Jude Colborn and yeah I just built this ship. It's the USS Salt Lake City. So I started out like about a year ago. I built it. It took me about a week and then I upgraded it right before World War Brick which took me about a couple of days. And then the Basilosaurus, which is a type of prehistoric whale, I did that um, about a year ago. And then it got broken apart, so I built a smaller version that's more to scale with the ship. And yeah, that's just Poseidon. <laughs> I wanted to put Poseidon on there. There you go. Very neat. So if you can take us through some of the details on the ship and kind of how you worked on it and what, what all the, the different parts of the ship are there. Yeah. Well, these are the, there's like the front, which that... Well, the hole, I basically took a, um, I made like a frame of like a one brick wide frame. And then I built like out from that, like with snot technique. And then I took the, with the turrets, they used to be smaller and used like the, you know, the clips with the holes in the middle. Yeah, yeah. They used those for the barrels. But when we were ordering pieces, they didn't have any of those. So I had to make the turrets a little bigger, which is actually good because it's more to scale. And then with the superstructure, originally it was like, it didn't have this in the middle here and it didn't have these anti-aircraft guns. But I changed it up because um, it was just more realistic like that. And then the float planes, or the float plane, this also used to be different. This was white with a yellow tail and it wasn't a biplane. And then I changed that so that it was a blue biplane. <laughs> and then the crane. This is just my basic design for a crane. Didn't really... It wasn't very hard for me. <laughs> but And then these anti-aircraft guns, they were actually um, pretty hard to... It took a lot of brain racking to come up with a good way to use the anti-aircraft guns.
I like how you did that though with that really tiny scale using the one by one tile there as kind of the protective plates. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was kind of fun. <laughs> it was fun to come up with, yeah. And then this used to also be way different. This used, the back superstructure used to be a lot like the front superstructure, but then I changed that up completely to make it more realistic. That's kind of my whole thing. I want to make it as realistic as possible. And then the turrets in the back are just the same as the front. But yeah, the whole reason I built it was because my mom, she figured out which ship my great grandpa was on and then decided, and then, uh, so I looked up, uh, I looked it up and looked at a picture of it and I was like, all right, this is really cool, so I'm gonna build it. So then I built it and now it's here, which this is pretty awesome. This is the first time I brought a mock to World War Brick and it's super fun. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it turned out really nice too, and I love the family connection here. So you've got the, the photo of your, your great-grandfather there, and then on the right, is that some photos of the, the real ship itself? Yeah, okay. yeah, that, that was super fun to like. And actually, the whole reason I changed this was because of these photos, and I was looking at them, and I was like, wait, I've got the back superstructure off. I've got to change that. <laughs> Well, I think it turned out really nicely, so I'm glad you were able to bring it. Do you have plans to build more LEGO ships like this in the future? Definitely. I think I might, next time I go to World War Brick, I might do something that's more ground-based, and then the next year I might add the USS Pensacola. Okay. Well, very nice. Thanks for taking the time to, to show us your build here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. I'm Brom Briggs. I built these two ships here, uh, World War Brick, this year at 2017. Um, so this one is the USS Johnston, um, it's a Fletcher class destroyer. Um, and then this one next, behind it is the USS Sangamon, um, an escort carrier. Uh, its class is kind of unusual because it was converted from an oiler, um, and so hence it's unusual shape compared to most. Um, but, and so um, the Johnston was uh, made earlier, or mid to late end of the war, um, originally planning to be uh, be a destroyer, so it wasn't converted from everything or from anything. Um, it was uh, like like I said, um, it was towards the end of the war, but it fought in the Pacific uh, Pacific campaign. Um, so, but uh, it's got f uh, five of these. Uh, let's see, can never remember. I have all this stuff here uh, for it, uh, but it's got five uh, five inch guns and then six to ten. 40 or 20 millimeter okay. anti-aircraft guns right here and here, um, as well as 21 inch torpedo tubes right here that would turn off to the side to release. Some of them don't very well, but, um, and then just anti-aircraft nests here and here, and then the very back. Um, also, it's kind of noteworthy to say, I, um, when I first, I first had this last year, um, but I used a lot of brick arms elements to help uh, ease along the build. And this year it's completely purist. There's nothing um, third party whatsoever. It's all brick built. Um, but, and so it's uh, in actuality, like it's real dimensions. It's like uh, 375 feet, just about a little more than that. And then uh, about 40 feet across um, and carried about 300 men in it. Um, but in World War II, it was hit um, and sunk, but the um, the crew had enough time to exit the uh, ship, so most of them made it out alive. Okay. I, li I like how smooth both the ships you have here, and I know we'll talk about the other one in a second, but both of them look really smooth, and I really like that. It, it doesn't have that. There's, sometimes the build does look good with like yeah. a lot of exposed studs or something, but I like how you've made everything look very smooth yeah. uh, and, and sleek, kind of looking like that. Yeah. So in the front deck, actually... The front deck um, was really difficult here. I'll remove this here for a second because uh, it went from six studs down to five and then down to five and a half, a little bit more than a half, five and two tiles uh, or four and two tiles to four to three and two tiles to three to two and two tiles to two and then to one and two tiles and then finally to one before it tapered off and I couldn't put anything there. Uh, and so it uses a lot of jumpers underneath it a lot of jumper plates and um, different types of connections. It's a whole mess underneath, <laughs> as well as being sloped up smoothly. Um, so it starts off here with uh, being two plates and two bricks high, uh, plus tile, to in, right here in the front being uh, about four bricks high. And so, but the whole deck is 
because there was enough space, I managed to just put a few more uh, studs underneath it and give it the nice uh, sloped look you can see here without uh, ruining it with like lots of steps. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was uh, another modification I made from last year, so it's a lot smoother now. Um, I kind of did that in the back as well. It's a little bit more difficult, especially with the anti-aircraft nest because it's a weird kind of hexagon shape in, uh, actu in like reality, even though it looks like a triangle. So we had to uh, capture that look. I actually had um, Brick Arms U-Clips holding it together, and then uh, Andrew Summers came over and helped me uh, create it to a purest look. And so there's a few pieces in there that are kind of mismatched, discolored, but that's because it was all impromptu made here. <laughs> yeah, uh, always, uh, you know, making it better. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I tried to do. Um, and then also, uh, in when I uh, came home after World War Brick last year, um, I was looking at my book, and then I realized if I push the page like that, there's a whole other turret that would have been right here that I completely missed. And so I had to chop the section right around here uh, and add about five more bricks in order to fit this and then make it a little longer there. And so um, that was kind of a pain, but I wanted to be meticulous in making it realistic and uh, to scale as well. And so um, that was after World War Brick last year. And then I also got rid of some Brick Arms elements on the turrets, made them a little shorter. Uh, they're about the size of a two by three plate. And then I got them down to a little less than that. Um, and then also here, it's kind of, I think it would be fun to show, but, oh, this one's a bad example, sorry. But here, um, so I had actually very few uh, one by one clips, but the ones that I did have were broken and that's the ones that you can see I used here for the <laughs> turret. So it's, I didn't break them on purpose, but um, can blame Lego for that thanks to their new uh, newer ones. Use every piece you've got there though. <laughs> yeah, and so that was that was something. And then also on the antenna, um, I guess it's kind of noteworthy to say if I can get it out of here. Um, so the antenna, the very tip of it itself is actually uh, three wide track links um, that I had got um, at a used store. Let's see if I can pick this off and then put it over here. Uh, so for the contrast, you can see it's got some Lego minifigure hands on an older uh, connector piece as well as the track links with a bar placed through them try, uh, trying to give off the as realistic as uh, I can for an antenna without also using non-lego elements and so very cool so that's the first ship you've got here and then the second the second one the bigger aircraft carrier how does that connect to this as far as the historical timeline so historically uh, this is the USS Sangamon here I'll move this away a little bit so we can bring it up but um, so they both fought in uh, the same battle as well as uh, they were kind of in the same task force okay. called Taffy 3. Um, and so, whoop. let's see if I can bring it up here. So the Sangamon uh, was converted like an, from an oil tanker, like I said earlier. Um, it, so it's got a weird kind of unusual shape for um, an escort carrier. It's a little bit smaller than an actual aircraft carrier. And so uh, it was used to mainly transport the planes rather than land them and uh, fly them off. Um, but uh, it transported um, Hellcats and uh, Corsairs mainly, and that's what you can see here at, uh, for the miniature planes, is uh, probably Corsairs. I kind of put them together, hoping they would be one of the two. Depends on how you look at them. Um, but so the Sangamon, uh, when I was doing research actually, um, it was really ironic, but um, it had, uh, it, was then, it was built in uh, 1939 and then to the war effort. Uh, within nine months, they had converted it into an escort carrier. Um, and it survived all of World War II, um, only to meet its uh, doom in uh, Osaka, Japan, where it was uh, scuttled and used for scrap parts. Uh, and so ultimately the Japanese, I guess you could say, did defeat it, <laughs> uh, which is rather sad. Um, but, and so it's got um, a working elevator here. I used to have a gear on the side that I could twist that would bring it up and down, but that broke after transportation last year. Um, and then there should have been another one in the back, but I just uh, didn't have the time, I guess, to put it in. That's another thing. I'm always trying to make it better, trying to make it more accurate and realistic. Um, the side anti-aircraft guns I actually made uh, just like three days ago. I've been a procrastinator, um, but they're, they're just kind of like very loose, but um, tried to make those accurate as well. Uh, this whole side panel catwalk is used with snot and some clips you can see here. Um, and then with a couple lifeboats and then there's a larger lifeboat underneath. But most of the detail is actually on the side of the ship. Uh, if you compare to the picture here, um, lots of the little 
portholes and uh, deck sides um, are actually where they should be under this uh, ship. So you notice I did, uh, I used the Technic bricks. So there's four portholes there, two there, two there, two there. And then I uh, did that exact same um, location underneath the boat, trying to get, make it as accurate as possible. Um, and so try to spare no detail, especially on the hole being the hardest uh, thing to create. Um, and so it's got all of the little details I can spare and build. I guess. Yeah, nice. And one thing I noticed is your planes, like pretty much the whole thing is built almost upside down. Yeah, so yeah. how did that work? Um, so lots of people, uh, actually that's one of the first things they'll notice, um, is I, I disassembled one to show what would happen if I tried to build it right side up. And lots of people uh, notice that it's built upside down, um, which a, not a lot of Lego things usually are built upside right. down. Lego rarely puts studs upside down, save for like maybe Luke Skywalker in the cave. Um, but, and so it's... It was easier to put the um, use binoculars to create the guns, and then also to put the propeller on upside down with some cut, uh, flex tubing, um, because if if it were to build right side up, I couldn't use this clip there, and so um, that, and then also given the wheels as well as the um, pieces here, the binoculars used uh, would make it really really difficult uh, to build right side up, and so I just decided to build it, build it upside down as well, and so that would. That makes it a little closer to the scale as well. They're a little bit bigger. Um, all of these are built in one 180th scale, uh, but the planes are probably a slightly larger than that, but that's as close as I could get them to, uh, uh, being to scale. Um, I guess uh, they, the pieces for the tail fin, actually, the one by two inverted slopes, um, they're all uh, a lighter pale blue compared to the planes. Um, which it's not entirely done um, on accident because lots of the planes did do that. Um, but also the pieces on uh, Brick Link and Dark Blue were only in two sets, so they're about $3 a uh, pop, and I didn't want to spend that money on just the little planes. Uh, Understandable. Yeah, well, I think both of these turned out really amazing, so I appreciate you taking us through them. I think there's some, some really cool details on both of them, so, and good job yeah, getting the details you. just right. And I, I love that you use the kind of reference book here and everything. So is this just like a general uh, like ship history book? or what? Uh, actually, this is really funny. Um, a friend of my mom's had an entire encyclopedia on World War II um, in his basement that he never used and so this is uh, 17 out of uh, 26 volumes wow. in the entire encyclopedia and so I was just flipping through and I really wanted to make a boat and I luckily found this one um, on the page and then after building this I wanted to build another one probably bigger and this was on the same page so it was kind of a coincidence came to be an accident that I built the both of them on uh, in the same battle on the same page as well um, and I've used it so much to the point where like the back is all cracked and broken now and so I'll have to rebind that and fix it later but but you're putting it to good use that's good it's better yeah. than just sitting <laughs> yeah um, so yeah there's I guess that's that's one point that could be made it also looks really nice in my room makes me look a lot more professional than I actually am <laughs> Uh, being on the high school budget, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, that's really neat. I appreciate you taking us through the builds. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. Thank you. My name is Karev Santan, and this is the front side of USS Cassian Young that's in Charleston Navy Yard in Boston. And uh, I started um, with a first um, uh, design for the hull, which was flat, and then I slowly uh, made it more curved to make it more realistic. And then I started on the top part with the cannons and the like initial building here, which I just laid on top and just built up. And then right now it's just placed on top. And uh, the cannon design, I used a lot of slopes and bricks. And then uh, I put some dis uh, designs on there as a, like a ladder. And then the cannon, I just used uh, circular bricks. And then for the building right here, um, I did uh, some door designs that I got inspiration from uh, Dan's old version of USS Nicholas. And uh, then I put some uh, door there and a ladder um, from inspiration from other builds of other types of uh, ships. And then I uh, slowly made my way to the back part where I put the little flat guns, which I designed myself. Um, based off of uh, a bunch of pictures of old uh, uh, Fletcher class destroyers that I found. And then I uh, just put a bunch of Technic pieces that I thought maybe would add more to it. And then I made my way to the bridge 
where um, I originally based this off of Greyhound, the movie. So I put right there on uh, the little um, uh, lookout place uh, a kind of version of uh, Tom Hanks. And then in the inside, I did a, um, that's where they drive the ship. They have um, just some sailors manning it uh, where they control most of the ship. And uh, that's it for the ship. I'm going to continue working on the rest of the ship uh, slowly. And then I started doing the harbor, which um, I based it off of a design um, of a submarine U-boat base, um, where it's mostly just concrete, flat, um, has some uh, garages um, for cargo, and then I tried to make it more look like it's a secure place, so I put a, um, a, a, a bunch of fencing, a little booth where um, they guard it and they um, like know who's coming and who's unloading stuff. And then I added some figures over there um, that were unloading cargo to put on the ship. And in this scene, I tried to make it look like the ship is arriving just from duty and uh, they're going to rearm and resupply the ship to go back into battle. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great layout here. One thing that I like is how you've kind of taken just a section of the ship and decided to build that out here. So you're still able to do a lot of detail uh, and even without doing the entire ship here. So talk about kind of your design, design de decision there. Um, yeah, I obviously wanted to start with the front part of the ship because if I were to not finish it, it would still look com almost complete. And uh, I thought I really liked in these class of World War II destroyers, I like the two cannons that are one's on the bottom, one's on the top. And I really like that shot from the front, which makes it, uh, I don't know, I just really like that photo and design. And even if you don't complete the ship, it still looks complete. And then I obviously wanted to do the bridge because I love the background of the bridge. You can see the windows in the background. And it just, uh, yeah, I really like that um, design of ship. Now, because this is only part of the ship, you are able to look at the back here and kind of see some of how the, the design came together. So talk about kind of the whole design and how you were able to make this structurally. Um, yeah, so I initially, the very front part of it is just completely solid with Lego bricks in the middle. Um, I did a lot of, used a lot of Lego window pieces uh, because it added a lot of, uh, I didn't have to completely fill it in and it added a lot of structural support. Um, and then at the very end, I, there's some hollow parts where I thought it was pretty solid and I didn't need to put bricks in there, but most of this is just filled in with window pieces or just solid uh, colorful bricks. And then at the very end, I used uh, 16 by 16 uh, dark bluish gray um, plates to cover it off and then if I do continue it I'll take that off and uh, put that at the very end where I end it. So if you continue it what's the full size going to be do you think if you do the entire ship? Uh, yeah so I, if I do continue it I think I'll do it into maybe four or three sections and so I might tile this more smoothly and then create a new um, section which I can uh, push in of the uh, another uh, like three cannons and then the middle part with more like flat guns and more part of the bridge and uh, mast. One de cool detail you were able to include is the numbers on the side so was that difficult to incorporate that obviously you've got a ton of gray and that having to work those white parts in there. Yeah so when I initially did the uh, flat side that was a lot easier I did uh, used white um, one by eights and one by twos and some one by ones to make it um, uh, have the numbers of seven, nine, six, I think. And uh, I tried to redo that when I redid the uh, hull and I thought it came out really well. Um, and if you look at it from the side, it is a little um, not clear, but I think it put out a good, um, yeah, a 796. I think it looks good. Yeah. You were still able to represent it, at least. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about kind of the historical significance of this ship. Why did you choose to build this uh, for your model? Yeah, so in uh, late 2021, I went to the Charleston Navy Yard and I saw, the, saw this as a museum. And uh, I got this pamphlet that showed all the history of it 
which uh, it served in the Pacific War and got hit by two kamikaze attacks. And um, I like, I mean, I'm a, I really like World War II and I thought um, to base it off of this one because I have a lot of pictures from what I went, when I went and I obviously saw it so I can look at the tiny details um, so I can include that in a, yeah, I like putting those tiny details so it uh, looks more complete and yeah. You were also able to incorporate lights here in kind of the bridge section, which always makes a build stand out. What type of lights did you use there? How did you incorporate that? Um, I'm not exactly sure what company, but I found some lights that have uh, tiles in it and then the lights in the bottom. So it's small enough to hide it so you don't see the wires in it. And then you just put it on top. And I put three of them and I thought it give, gave um, uh, the perfect... Um, representation of what it's like in there instead of just a dark room yeah well excellent work on the whole layout here thanks for bringing it out to the show yeah thank you